His work's focused on uh, devising urban renewal strategies for post-industrial contexts and defining modern vernacular architecture and urban patterns. His investigation fields range from rural um, villages in Vietnam to European shrinking cities and hinterlands. So it's a recipient of nominees of numerous international awards and competitions, including European 16, Living um, Cities Italy, European 15, Productive Cities uh, uh, 2, France Biennale, uh, Stuttgart, the Stadt Region Stuttgart. I'm not putting this in the right order, am I? Because it's got a lot of... Uh, you're going to help me out here? <laughs> World, Euro World Architectural Festival. Uh, we also have in Amsterdam, Association of Siamese Architects International Competition. The list just goes on and on and on and on. You're super amazing. Super amazing. Like, shorten it, shorten it. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> well, actually, the, the best thing to do is to let him speak because when he presents, it's, uh, it's super interesting. He didn't make it through the whole presentation last time, so I'm hoping that you're going to share some of the stuff that was at the end because you've got amazing work. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Stop it. He's like, stop it. Okay, done. Thank you, Richard, for, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you overrated my, my work and myself, so, uh, yeah, I, so my name is Chung Mai, uh, I try to rename my name now, because uh, if I say Mai Hung Chung, everybody think I'm, my name is Hung, I don't know why, but now, uh, yeah, just call me Chung Mai, uh, or Chung in short. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, self-trained uh, urban urban designer and a very amateur uh, researcher. I'm also the 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 one who created a uh, hundred ad hoc uh, three years ago in 2020. And a lot of people ask me uh, about the origin of the name hundred ad hoc. So today I kind of want to start with that term. Uh, so it started with the book called Atoxism uh, by um, Jenks. Uh, he's a, a landscape architect, furious, very build anything, but who write a lot. Um, and the name, well, you, you you can see the 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 picture here is actually a, a wheelchair made of foul objects, um, the gas pine, um, and the you know elements from the agriculture uh, tractor. So uh, ad hocism is actually a design principle um, using um, ready-made or foul object uh, or kind of uh, um, something that you have on hand and repurpose uh, the function, the origin function, to fit into uh, the existing condition um, to solve the problem in the quickest manner and in the shortest time. So it's represent like, the most efficient way uh, of dealing with the problem. And it's also a kind of a, a counter uh, part of um, what we call like planet uh, designed or top down uh, approach. Um, so the, about the chair, I, I also want to talk about Mr. Nguyen-Kwiduk, uh, when um, uh, during one of his uh, TEDx talk in Hanoi, he actually talked about um, our way uh, of Vietnamese people dealing with the situation, which linked directly to what I'm um, just talk about. So he took an example of the chair with um, when when it's broken, like one leg is broke, broken. Uh, we we can really uh, quickly find the way to handle it to quickly uh, repair and 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 keep it uh, permanently uh, when it's working. So um, the, the the our culture is really uh, to um, you know is is based on ad hocism when we don't really um, want to improve. Uh, the the situation, but uh, um, more like keep the temporary uh, and become permanent. I'm I'm not criticizing it, but it's it's also a kind of an, an another approach uh, to dealing with the the situation. 
Um, and the city is actually, the city of Hanoi is actually um, represent very well the, what he's talked about, uh, about the chair. The city is actually the uh, kind of uh, the reflection of uh, people behavior and, and how uh, we, we think and how we, uh, we deal with the situation. So um, when I talk, uh, when I think about working on Hanoi, I try to think about what makes Hanoi different from other cities. So ad hocism is one of the uh, kind of, uh, for me, like identical elements uh, or aspect that, one, that I, I want to focus on. So that's why uh, the name of the, the organization or my projects or the approach is uh, Hanoi ad hoc. Um, another, um, well, uh, about the structure of the of the projects, um, it's actually based on uh, one of the um, most influent architect of our time, Ram Kulas, um, on um, the the book called Elements of Architecture. It's also uh, the team for the Biennale in uh, 2014 in Venice. Uh, so basically, I, I had a chance to, to, to meet with him and uh, talk, you know, have an exchange with him too, uh, how to expand this idea of analyzing uh, architecture uh, through the anthropological point of view to the urban scale, which is the city. So at that time, I called the projects uh, elements of the city, and I want to test the idea on uh, a specific location, which is Hanoi. And uh, surprisingly, he, he kind of support that idea. And, and that's why I came back to, to Paris at that time and start to contact uh, people. Because I'm not a researcher, but I know that there's a, a lot of you know, scholars on Vietnamese study uh, who know better than me and can help me with it. So one of the first person that I contact is uh, Christina Stringer, uh, who is here. And she's uh, one of the first member of Hanu ad hoc and stay until now. Um, um, and also I contact other people from different fields like um, uh, urbanists, uh, scholars, um, artists, um, other architect, and uh, geograph as well. Because the, the idea is to have, I always interested in um, working with people from different field uh, and different kind of uh, you know, interface with architecture. Architecture itself can't exist alone. It can't stand alone. As, and I don't think, I don't even think architect is, is a, a job, you know. It's kind of outdated job. And um, now we are kind of a, a connector. Uh, we don't, uh, we can't draw um, everything from one to, to, to ten anymore. Uh, actually, we we only the 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 one who connect uh, the expertise uh, to to work together on the project. So I think it's very important to kind of have a interdisciplinary uh, group of people working on 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 you know urban elements and uh, and I think the city is also belong to everyone. So uh, everybody has the you know same kind of right to. Uh, contribute to its future. Uh, our structure based, uh, of research based on three, three main um, act, uh, archive, theorize, and provocation. Uh, so um, one of the reasons why I start with archive because in, in Vietnam we, we actually don't have the culture of archive. When we, we start doing something uh, or searching for something, uh, I think many people, you will have the same difficulty as me that we can't find uh, anything uh, existing. So we need to kind of uh, build our own archive uh, or gathering uh, the existing information uh, and put everything in orders. So I think organizing and putting in orders and repackage them is uh, also very important as creating them. Uh, the second act is uh, theorize. So unlike a normal architecture project that go from problem to solution, or solving uh, a problem, I, I, I want 
to slow down the process a little bit um, to um, create a, a in between stage which uh, where, uh, in which we 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 sit down and think uh, of you know how to analyze this and how um, w to use the data that we connected to tell a story uh, to, 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 to kind of unearth the, the intangible value of, uh, uh, kind of the view environment. And then the provocation is the part where we invite people, the community, to uh, contribute the ideas uh, of the, you know, of the future uh, living environment. Um, it could be, it, it's not a solution. It's not, a, um, we, we are not trying to, to find a, a solution. Uh, but uh, try to provoke uh, a public debate uh, like what we have uh, later this morning. It's what actually I, I think the most valuable in, in the conversation. So uh, we, we started um, um, the, the, the first year of uh, Hanoi Ad Hoc by uh, investigating um, the factories or industrial heritage um, so a lot of people also ask me like why we start with 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 uh, the factories uh, but not um, you know housing or or monuments because you know there's a lot more thing to talk about it um, but uh, yeah I actually it's by by accident uh, that I uh, in when I, when I start to to look at um, the information about uh, the the Zandong light bulb factory uh, after a, a huge fire in uh, 2018, I guess. Um, I, I couldn't find any information because I want to propose a, a project on ideas for the city. Um, and I can't even uh, find a, 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 a plan or even the master plan. Um, so uh, I was like, um, thinking maybe we like myself I have to build my own database and I hire a guy who actually a, a wedding photographer to use drone uh, to capture the whole uh, entire um, factory uh, and rebuild the point cloud model out of it and from then I, I have the kind of kind of proper data with a very um, precise measurement uh, to work on and then when, because I, I'm kind of ambitious at that time when I was still young, uh, I kind of like, okay, I, I already have a, a kind of a good database for one factory, why not I, um, because the factory itself doesn't exist alone. Uh, it, 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 there's a, a, an ecosystem around it. So I, I, I want to build a whole industrial, like I want to understand the whole industrial landscape, uh, how um, the, the light bulb factory has situated in the, 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 you know, the whole context uh, of industrialization of Vietnam. So I start to build uh, the whole database about uh, over 100 uh, factories in, in Hanoi. Um, and the first uh, step is get, you know, data gathering uh, images, uh, information, uh, you know, uh, from the archive and library and books and research. Uh, so this is kind of a desk-based study uh, process where we have a lot of volunteers to help with us, uh, help us to 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 build uh, the database. And then from there, we we uh, also have a want to have a kind of um, a visual geographical. Um, um, understanding about the location and how uh, the factory uh, situated in in the city and and the, to, to understand the interface between the industrial area with uh, the other urban fabric so that's why I kind of um, built the a series of them uh, thematic uh, maps um, and also uh, scanning 3d scanning uh, uh, the to digital digital preserve the, the 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 factory and rebuild the entirely the 3D models um, f not only for us but also for people who potentially work on the same topic they can use the our database to you know 
um, to have a better understanding about the, the factory. And actually, uh, one of our factory uh, of interest uh, that we, uh, we rebuilt uh, digitally has, um, the model has been used for the festival uh, of creativity of Hanoi. So we sent it to the organizer and uh, actually, uh, we are kind of happy that our work uh, uh, serve for the, you know, the community. Uh, alongside uh, the research activities, we also have a kind of extra activity organizing event, uh, public talks uh, according to you know, different themes and topics uh, for each year, and also workshop. Um, and the yeah, the one of the the the, the most important outcome is to have an exhibition to showcase our work uh, during two years uh, on the factory. So uh, this is the Zalem factory um, in, in Long Bien, uh, which is one of the largest factory. So um, the exhibition was uh, very un unexpected because I actually, uh, many of you knows uh, about, well, actually Elise, uh, we, <laughs> we approached uh, Elise a long time ago to work on the exhibition together. But at that time, we couldn't find any location um, and budget for it. So we kind of uh, delayed it for, I think, more than a year. And you know, just luckily, uh, I got a, a, a message from UNESCO uh, saying that um, this year exhibition of the Festival of Creativity of uh, the city of Hanoi Will be uh, we will happen in in a factory in in Long Bien, um, and they want me to to get involved. And I think that you know even uh, I I work for free for during like three months, but uh, I was really really appreciate the the chance that they gave it to me uh, to have an um, exhibition about the factory inside a factory. Um, so. Um, in order to, well, so the, the concept of industrial heritage is not uh, something new in the world, but it's not completely um, um, kind of um, accepted uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, according to the, the regulation or the rules, uh, buildings uh, less than 100 years is not considered as heritage, right? So when people think about heritage, they tend to think about uh, pagoda or you know old house in the old quarters or you know like old buildings so the 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 this i mean like the uh the longevity of the the buildings is actually a, a requirement for uh, being accepted as a heritage so i i have to think about like how we can you know find an argument about the existence of our exhibition about the industrial heritage. Uh, so I look up, you know, I talk to people, and there's a there's a student who, um, you know, he he he's, uh, has been following Hano Ad Hoc for a long time, and he wants to meet. And I actually I have a a, a really get great con conversation with him. He's a student in archaeology, and um, I I actually uh, learn from him about this book called Behavior Behavior Archaeology. So uh, the, the term is actually referred to uh, a way of um, investigating the archaeology, uh, um, not only the past, but also the present and the recent past. Um, the core concept or the fundamental concept is to, uh, the act of archaeology is to study the rela relationship between the human behavior and the material cultures. So if we expand that notion, that means uh, uh, the time frame doesn't really matter anymore. We can actually investigate uh, the recent part, which is the industrial uh, industrialization uh, era. And uh, um, that's why, uh, that's also give me an idea of, you know, like maybe we, we could create something um, that inspired from you know an archaeological site, which is unfinished, and 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 that give people a different way of interpretate. Uh, another influence is from um, 
an, uh, an architect, uh, uh, engineer, uh, urban designer, Inferon Cheda. He's, um, he's also uh, a socialist and uh, um, the author of the expansion of Barcelona. And uh, what he proposed uh, is to have a grid. Uh, because for him, the, the morphology of the grid is the best um, uh, arrangement that allow um, everybody have uh, the same right to the space. Uh, every corner of the grid is exactly equal in terms of you know, spatial value and uh, experience. And also the grid is, uh, uh, during the, the industrialization, is also represent um, the, you know, the most efficient way of circulating, of uh, transporting uh, for you know, um, transportation, but also energy in the city, hygiene. And uh, he actually, uh, at that time, uh, car doesn't ex really exist. Uh, there's only train, but when he see train, he he say that oh actually, uh, I think in the future there might be a, a small engine that can move around the city, which is car now. I know that um, city design for car is a bad idea for for now, but at that time it's kind of avant garde, uh, and he actually designed this city based on his theory about the a future heritage. Uh, so this is my uh, exhibition, uh, my, my grid, uh, or archaeological site, or some people uh, interpret it as a, um, a graveyard or a symmetry uh, of, the, you know, of the factory, which is, I think is, is also kind of true. Uh, it's a kind of, it has a memorial, it, it looks like a memorial, actually. So I'm happy with a different type of way of interpreting my, my architecture. So the exhibition itself has a, um, three main parts. Uh, as you see, the grid uh, is divided in three parts. Uh, the first part uh, is uh, showcasing the, uh, our works during two years, around about 10 factories uh, of interest where we, um, you know, um, showing our archive and theorized uh, part with, you know, including the movies. And the second part uh, is uh, actually uh, the part that we want to provoke uh, by, uh, be provoked by, by the artists, inviting, um, you know, um, a sculptor who, who uh, artists who, who work with uh, the foul object uh, based on the, you know, our philosophy ad hocism, uh, um, to 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 create a kind of a a foul object in the kind of archaeological site. So the whole thing looked like uh, it should be there. Uh, it is something that you unearth and find it. It's not something that we add on. So that's the idea, and also that's why I I want everything like look have a kind of a transparencies even you know, in the way we use materials and, 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 and the morphology or the tectonic of, um, you know, a, arrangement of uh, different architectural elements. It's based on that uh, idea of transparencies and uh, we want to kind of emphasize on the communication or the dialogue between the new and the old uh, architecture. Uh, and if you, if you you visit the, the exhibition, you will see that actually every part or every model that we use uh, is the, a fractal of the whole uh, structural span. So that's why it's, I, I, you know, the idea is to make everything fit into the, the existing buildings. Uh, from a bow of the, uh, the grid during the daytime, so actually, I, I, I kind of surprised that um, the exhibition uh, is have, kind of have two life, day life and night life. In, during the daytime, like, people kind of interact with it, and, and it's kind of playful. Uh, we have like, children coming, playing with uh, 
uh, the models that we, we prepare. So this is also part of our uh, provocation part where I, I want to invite people and the community from different you know, ages uh, uh, to, to, to find an idea collectively for the future of the, uh, of the, of the factory itself and also for the city. Um, and actually, uh, we, we kind of surprised with some of the proposal from little kids. Uh, some want to turn it into, you know, just housing or, you know, even prisons. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, it's very playful and, and, and um, but during the day, uh, night time, uh, In typology of adaptation, which is to form the uh, um, tiger cage um, as a kind of a, a resist, like symbol of the resistance of you know. Uh, human behavior to the the top-down ideological approach. The second one uh, that we are conducting actually with RMIT during this workshop to studying um, the the way people um, subdivide the the interior spaces in the trip house and the French villa uh, to adapt to the you know new living condition and new. Uh, political uh, kind of ideas. And the third one uh, that we want to investigate on the culture where um, the most uh, wanted uh, typologies that I want to investigate is the, the Love Hotel, which is a kind of a taboo project, uh, like concept in when people want to talk about. But uh, for me, it's a kind of a, um, the when we, we think about the, the way people live in the neo tube house with the, the arrangement, like v very vertical and hierarch uh, with the hierarchies, uh, actually people don't have the um, intimacy anymore. So the, 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 the hotel uh, or the love hotel is actually um, a kind of a, a symbol or a kind of the extension of the, the bedroom or your, your private spaces. So that's also one of the uh, main focus that we want to work on this year. Um, and we actually uh, finished uh, the first uh, workshop with the uh, Goethe Institute and, uh, and the House of the World Culture in Berlin on the KTT. So we investigated uh, free uh, KTT in, in Hanoi and also like kind of with the help of Christina and other scholars, we kind of uh, have different exercise about uh, um, the KTT, and we also organize a game uh, of uh, you know uh, inviting people again community participation on um, you know it's, it's uh, this game is a little bit different from the other one. So the main concept uh, come from one of my friend, who is also an architect, but now he's an artist. 
uh, and uh, the idea is to uh, to let people play the role of the inhabitant in in the KTT and give them the right to extend their house as much as possible. But ha they had to find the, the right argument to do that. So the whole game is a, a process of negotiation. So yeah, uh, that's uh, basically what uh, I have done so far. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. That was uh, very fascinating. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I'm curious. Is the exhibition still on? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore? OK. It's that's. Still there. The is still there. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah, that was really fascinating. I'm sure we will pick up on that in, uh, in the later discussion. And uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Tao, Tao Nguyen. Uh, Tao Nguyen is a Vietnamese Australian artist and educator and researcher based in uh, Narm, Melbourne. And uh, she's the coordinator of the Contemporary Art and Social Transformation CAST Research Group and also the executive officer at the Australian Council of University Art and Design Schools. And her research and creative practice investigates the impact of whiteness and the weaponization of language on Asian Australians. So I hand over to you. Uh, so I will be presenting in English. Um, xin chào các anh chị, bạn và quý khách. Um, my name is Tao, and today I'm presenting on behalf of a larger team on the Daydaw project. So Daydaw here there is a cross-cultural craft and design exchange between emerging uh, design talent in Vietnam with established designers in both Vietnam and Australia. I'd like to thank RMIT Vietnam and the Vietnamese Women's Museum for hosting and for Rachel and VFCD for the invitation to speak. Um, it's been truly amazing to listen to Trung and to all the speakers this morning. Um, just really amazing, creative, intelligent artists and designers. Um, today I'm coming in with a slightly different positionality. Um, and it's not within my capacity as an artist uh, or designer or even a researcher, um, but instead in the very um, unsexy, um, often overlooked, uh, but nevertheless important role of the administrator, facilitator, coordinator, conduit connector, um, to support these craft um, and design talent. Um, these people that are already doing the work to preserve Vietnamese cultural heritage through contemporary creative practices. So the Daydaw project involves so many people who have invested their time, um, labor, energies, um, and expertise to make it all work. And so for this presentation, I will find ways in which you will hear from these people um, directly from the designers and their mentors um, you know, to showcase the diversity of people that has worked on this project. I also have a secondary goal, which is to highlight the hidden labor, the creative intelligence of facilitators um, as an imperative role in future heritage. So the Data project began with a vision to support the exchange of craft knowledge, cultural heritage, sustainable practices and professional development for craft and design practitioners in Vietnam via cross-cultural collaborations. And we're very lucky to be funded by the Australian Embassy in Vietnam. The project team consists of um, Grace McQuilton, Remy Khan, Tammy Wong Holbert and Becky Liu, and we began having conversations with Jiha from Vickers sitting there, um, which led to the opportunity to review uh, Vietnam Design Week's 2021 selection of top 25 plus five. We subsequently connected with four amazing practitioners who possesses um, innovative practices across fashion, textiles, ceramics and furniture making. So let's meet the designers. So I'll begin with M Han, whose collaboration I had the pleasure of facilitating. 
Nya was a design project focusing on a TV shelf cabinet um, inspired by the ancient three compartment of architecture. In this project, M Han was mentored by Yung Nguyen from Our Decoration Vietnam, um, Dale Hardman from Dale Jones, as well as RMIT academic Ronnie Lightcham. M Han had brilliant technical skills in digital renders and proposed a compelling design um, for a TV shelf cabinet with features of bamboo and this bright indigo colour. Han worked with a local craftsman to lift her design from a rendering to a physical object. Gu Hoi is a project which was conceived by M. Yop. Um, he had guidance from Jennifer Conroy Smith, a ceramicist and academic at RMIT uh, in Melbourne, um, and Le Ban Yop from Vietcraft. And the idea behind the work was to repurpose broken pottery shards um, in the Bang Chan Pottery Village to create ceramic paintings. I won't speak too much on the next two um, designers because you will hear from them via video. Um, but I will say that Anne Tom was mentored by James Patel from Outland, Outland Denim and G Talview, who you've heard from this morning from Kilomet 109. Um, and then Lynn um, was mentored again by G Talview. She's very busy. <laughs> um, and also Dewey Cook from the social studio. So I find that in these type of research symposiums, there are seldom opportunities um, where you hear directly from the people, the communities that you're working with. Um, so I just wanted to use this moment in my short 15 minutes um, to share two videos from Tom and Lynn. Um, they, better than I, can share um, what their practices are, what they do, and what this project means to them. Hi, uh, my name is Tom. I'm a designer, a fashion designer based in Saigon, Vietnam. I founded a studio, Comodian Studio. I graduated in New York City uh, in major in fashion design. I worked there for a year and then moved back to Vietnam in 2016 and, and founded my studio. I have a love for textile. So uh, when I founded the studio, it was our focus since the beginning. And uh, we also known for reusing textile and upcycling uh, because we uh, the, the the supply textile supply in Vietnam is very limited. So we found all the ways uh, that uh, we can to make ourselves different. And one of them is by using uh, very um, adventurous textile treatments. The Tom projects uh, vividly portray the urban spirit. It's the ideas and design with the Bow Street Fashion Numa, who will recreate from the apparel waste that Tom and his team collected from numbers of local factories in Ho Chi Minh City. I love um, that Tom is just, he's really playful and he's, um, he's really passionate. And I love when he presents his work and the stuff that he's been, that he's passionate about. You can see his passion come through. And I think that he's, he's got what it takes um, to, to have a real, really good go at um, creating something very special and unique. Um, I think he is quite unique in the way he thinks about um, his designs and you know where he wants to see his own brand and career go. Um, so just, I think that's probably what I've also taken away is just watching just how, much, how much joy he seems to get from that um, and working through that process and then again taking that into his business. In the beginning we looked at it as a a uh, project more just for fun it was a personal project because we um, we had some time during covid and it was a time for us to stop thinking about retail um, commercial success and we dug deep into our personal uh, artistry and uh, we have uh, also applied our know-how about uh, fashion retail on top of the projects that we are working on. So it is going, um, is, is developed in a way that we didn't uh, expect it. Um, and now it, it, it is a, a collection that um, carries both uh, a art 
artistic perspective but also is functional and has some retail value in it. Through this project with Tom, I also see his strong skill for business. He has clear strategy and the ambition to be able to create a brand uh, to conquer the highly competitive international market. Tom's Moidian uh, is perfect example uh, of the youth of Vietnam creative scene today. Social responsible and fearless. This project is important to me because after a few years of working in, um, in uh, fashion, I think uh, the work itself um, needs some push in terms of uh, um, experiment and uh, and we want to uh, go out of our comfort zone which is uh, the, the products that is below let's say 2 million Vietnamese doll and we want to uh, try ourselves with products that are that cost more that requires more work and more um, creativity so this project allows us to do that Xin chào tôi là Linh hiện tại thì tôi đang sinh sống và làm việc tại Sapa uhm... Tôi là họa sĩ và thiết kế của thương hiệu thời trang thủ công Linh Handicraft, một thương hiệu thời trang thủ công do hai vợ chồng tôi sáng lập ra. Tại đây thì tôi kết hợp với đồng bào địa phương để tạo ra những sản phẩm thủ công và trên nền chất liệu vải tự, về tự nhiên, nhộn tự nhiên, um, mang tính độc bản, có giá trị thẩm mỹ và thân thiện với môi trường. Đến với dự án lần này thì tôi muốn giới thiệu đến với mọi người à, thiết kế những chiếc túi sách à, làm từ sợi rami, sợi thêm áp dụng các kỹ thuật đan móc, kỹ thuật thác túi của người giao tuyển. À, các chiếc túi sách này là nhộn hoàn toàn bằng chất liệu tự nhiên là chàm và cổ nâu và nó sẽ mang tính ứng dụng cao, hợp thời trang và thân thiện với môi trường. Talking about Phạm Phan Hoàng Linh here and their projects, I immediately think about the eco family and the craft elements in her design process. Ling know how to, to weave the abundant uh, natural local materials and the local resources into her each design. As a one trained painter, Ling's sketches are lively and warm. I can clearly see uh, Ling's deep love for handmade materials through everything she packed into this project. <coughs> thì tôi có tìm hiểu là người dân giao tiền đã sử dụng cái uh, cây rami này để làm nên những chiếc túi cho nên bắt đầu từ đó thì tôi đã đi qua bản của người giao tiền tìm hiểu họ các cái kỹ thuật xử lý sợi kỹ thuật thắt túi như thế nào để áp dụng cho những cái thiết kế của mình My name is Dewi Cook I'm CEO at the Social Studio and I'm a mentor on the Day Dot project Ling just shows herself to be somebody who um, has wonderful community connections in her work and just how valuable that is to her um, and the way she wants to um, you know exist within the sort of fashion landscape in Vietnam so I think what would be so exciting is to see the ways she's really trying to honor and um, bring to the forefront this traditional craftsmanship and artisanship that she sees um, in her region in Sapa um, from communities that aren't um, necessarily given that platform in a design um, sense as much. So I think uh, I would love and I hope to see that extend beyond this project that um, she continues to find inspiration um, with those craftspeople and continues to work um, with them to kind of elevate the beauty of what they do and, and how they can create together. I think, I mean, what I've loved about it is seeing how, kind of how pure um, Lynn's work is and how she has embedded herself um, in a part of her country um, where some of this knowledge and um, and craftsmanship exists and I think there is something um, for me very inspirational about seeing that about um, you know how humble she is in a way to kind of um, to want to 
create these items um, and and products with other community members because she herself is really taken with the work that they do and there's no real sense of superiority. Um, it's very much that she is learning from them as we are learning from her. Trong tương lai, tôi nghĩ những cái sản phẩm làm từ tự nhiên sẽ chiếm lĩnh được cái cảm xúc của người tiêu dùng và tôi hy vọng là tôi sẽ trong tương lai tôi sẽ trồng được cái nguồn nguyên liệu để um, uh, áp dụng cho những cái thiết kế um, từ cái chất liệu. Sau khi hoàn thành dự án thì tôi hy vọng những thiết kế của tôi là có cơ hội được sống tiếp để um, uh, để những cái đôi tay khéo léo của nghệ nhân uh, có cơ hội là được nhảy múa uh, tạo nên những nhịp điệu uh, đẹp cho đời. So Lynn and Tom are two very different fashion designers with these contemporary practices that preserves Vietnamese culture in different ways. Um, Lynn and Tom were invited to uh, uh, come to Melbourne uh, for 10 days for a residency um, in line with Melbourne Fashion Week. From this experience, they were both able to share their practices to a larger audience. Tom connected in with um, a lot of different businesses to stock his uh, garments, um, while Lynn um, is now working on expanding, um, well, extending her business to be able to ship to uh, different countries. Um, by most definitions, uh, we feel like this is a successful project. Um, if we're looking at the overarching goal, which is to support and facilitate these cross-cultural collaborations. I'll conclude my presentation today by sharing that what isn't seen in the videos, in the exhibitions, in the um, public programs and fancy websites is the importance of the roles of administrators and coordinators and translators. Um, you know, we, uh, as in these collaborations, uh, bridge the uh, cultural, social, and sometimes physical gap um, between the mentors and the mentees. We played the roles of the older siblings, so the Gs that looked after the Ms, um, and each of the coordinator is a woman of colour with their own creative practice as well. And this lived experience helps us understand some of the complexities and challenges which these designers um, face, um, and then from there can find creative solutions to address these issues. With the project team, I'm sincerely grateful to our peers up on the board here. Um, cảm ơn tất cả mọi người đã có sự hiện diện trong ngày hôm nay. Um, thank you for your presence, time and attention. What a gorgeous presentation. So thank you so much, Tao. That was uh, not only a beautiful narrative, but also an insights. Okay, so here we go. Where are we? There we are. Look at, please come to the floor, my dear friend. So we have one of our own now, come to present. <laughs> now we have, to be, we have to be patient with Han in a little bit because he wasn't feeling too great today. So I'm hoping, looking at your expertise in chiropractic services provider, I'm feeling a bit better. He's good. He's good. We've we've made him alive again. <laughs> Fantastic. So have. A, okay. Yes, he's using his laptop because he's going to show us his beautiful work, which requires um, his laptop. Okay. So a few things about Hanin. He's an artist um, from Hanoi. Um, he's got a really rich background, both in education and residencies, as well as shows. So his background, his educational background, is both in. Vietnam, but also in the US. Um, he's had residencies in more countries like than I could probably list in 10 minutes. <laughs> I think so we've got America, we have France, we have England, uh, we have Indonesia, I think he's got a residency as well. Um, is there anything that I miss? Michelle's nodding, going, yeah, the list goes on, the list goes on. He's really, really well established. Um, the other thing, he's had multiple solo and uh, group exhibitions, both nationally and internationally. 
Um, we're very honoured that we can call him one of our own in uh, RMIT. He's in our design studies program and recently just started his PhD. So he's on to a new journey um, into his life. Um, and maybe he's going to share some of his ideas around territories and questioning the philosophical constructs and underpinnings of our relationships to territories. Is that correct? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I am deeply sorry that I have missed this uh, morning session. Uh, I was exhausted for some reason. I couldn't wake up. And it might be because of the combination of overworking, bad time management, uh, the inability to say no, and uh, maybe because of the air pollution. Uh, I, I hope that you guys will be well. Um, so uh, it, to my excuse, I, I want to express that I deeply care about you, uh, about your practices, and I want to show you how I care about them in this presentation. So um, I'm showing a QR code on the screen. Uh, this is my sneaky way to trick you to visit my website. And when you scan the website, uh, sorry, you scan the, the code, it will lead you to my website. And uh, f uh, uh, you know, when you see my website, you see there's a link to my map. And this is the map that you will eventually end up uh, having. So I, I want to start uh, with a story. I studied in the US uh, from 2016 to uh, 2019. And in my last year in the United States, uh, I had my opportunity to go to a residency. Uh, the residency is Yaddo. Uh, people told me that the resi residency is a quite important residency program in the United States. So uh, I was very, very fortunate to, to be able to join. And uh, I, had, uh, I, I was there for a month. And when I was doing, uh, you know, I, I was making art there, I had my chance to uh, meet with an artist. She's, uh, her name is Deborah Zlosky, and uh, she's quite um, important in, uh, in, in, in the West Coast, in the East Coast. And she asked me uh, if she could visit my studio, and I uh, respectfully accepted uh, the proposal. And she came to my studio and I showed her my drawings about my imagined land, imagined territory, uh, how I carefully tried to avoid any cultural references in my work. And she told me that she, she, she said to me, uh, you are denying your Vietnamese-ness. And I, I was quite surprised by that statement. Uh, but it's, at the same time, I got a little bit like frustration as well. I was really frustrated. Uh, listening to that statement. I didn't know why. And after, after that, I, I tried to have some reflection. And I feel like my frustration, uh, you know, eventually uh, fueled uh, my motivation to make uh, this project I called my land. So there are two seeds uh, that growing in my practice. The first one might be my frustration when navigating uh, different philosophical discourses. I feel like I don't have enough vocabulary and the language skills to be able to make my position. And I feel like the other um, philosophical uh, discourses, they, they all feel very foreign to me. And, and the second seed is the fear of being converted into uh, an exotic belief by the power of, uh, by the power of articulation. Uh, so, so I, I, I care a lot about articulation, and I hope that by making this map, I can articulate uh, my ideas. So as you can see on this map, there are four areas. Here you have the local. Moving upward, you have the regional. Uh, crossing the river, you have the global. Crossing another river, you have the universal. And I, in my practice, I have been hating. I, I hate a lot of people. Um, and I, I want to position the haters. It's not like I hate them uh, physically. I, I don't hate them as people. 
but I, I feel like what they are doing is threatening what I'm doing, and I consider them as competitors. Uh, I want to compete with them. I want to prove that, um, to some extent, um, you know, m my thing can have my own position. And in the process of fighting against my enemy, I also have found my friends. And all my friends, I group here, um, together, I want to start first with um, this kind of legend. So as you can see on the screen, uh, the country X is the country of my friends. And this is a metaphysical country, so I have the friend who are long dead, the friend who might not have been uh, born yet, or uh, you know the people that I have never met, but I feel deeply connected to them. And also I have the people who uh, I, whom I feel very uh, threatening and also um, um, they, they, they're, taking my abil they're taking my chance to become independent. So uh, all the people I feel like I, I, I share the identity, I, I, I call that community country X. And all the enemy, I call it the uh, enemy or country non-X. Uh, I want to show you some clear friends that I have met along the way. Where is it? Oop, sorry. Uh, I, I own a Vinfast car, not because it's good, but because I feel like, uh, to your surprise, I feel like Vinfast is the most, one of the most Vietnamese things I have ever seen. I can see the, um, the, uh, the, the, the bold decision, because if you, if you, if you are a businessman, you would never, you, you would never make that decision to go to the US. This guy, he's, a very nationalist guy, and he just tried to use all of his means to prove a statement. And to me, this is type of a, I, I, I might call this type of thing as business art. He tried to use business means to create art, to make a statement. And I really appreciate the aesthetic of his move. And, and of course it's gonna fail, because if you read all the, um, uh, 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 financial uh, report, you know, however you call it, uh, you, you see that it's, he's going to fail. But it, it's, it's like something which, like me, I feel like I should look up to. And of course, uh, he emerged as a local company, but now he's trying to prove that he could survive on a global scale. And my practice is here as well. And uh, so, so here's my art, my art practice. I make maps, uh, uh, drawings, and uh, you know, a, a, an invented language. Also some video games that you can download from the App Store and Google Play Store. I made artifacts, I made measurement tools to uh, show you, to persuade you that there's a land that does in fact exist. I call that land my land. So when I say my land, it doesn't mean Hanning's land, but it means, uh, you know, when I call my land, it refers to me, and when you call my land, it refers to you. Uh, and uh, I've been working on this project um, since 2017, and, and uh, with the link, you can see all the drawings that I made, and they're all connected. They're all about um, an Im imagined land. Sorry. And the artifacts, uh, oops, sorry. And also the, um, the products. And sorry for, for dragging this around, but I have uh, an invented language here as well. Um, so, oh, by the way, uh, this is Babo. Uh, you guys are classified at regional. Um, and in the very near future, I will be a staff member of our space, which is functioning on a local scale. And here you see RMIT as well. I, I'm, I'm proving that I'm, I'm, I deeply care about what you're doing. Oh, I, I just keep that. You can discover it at home. 
uh, I really want to understand uh, what we mean by Vietnamness and Vietnamese-ness. Uh, I have created this work. I call this work the Low Impact Lunch. You have two components. Uh, the first component, B, is just bread. So bread is the type of food that we can find in all civilizations in the history. And A is, let's say, the cultural essence. And for this Asian, uh, uh, this Asian formula, you have sriracha, wasabi, oyster sauce, sweet chicken chili sauce, uh, mixed together, which provide you with a very minimum amount of calories in a pocketable size. You can put it in your pocket, and it uh, is, is made of uh, recyc recyclable materials. So, so I feel like I want to I want to ask uh, a question: uh, Do we do we have enough opportunities to deny our own culture? And what might be the importance of the ability to reject and reinvent our culture. I think it's very important for any powerful uh, and dominant culture and civilization to be able to reinvent itself. I feel like maybe it's, it might not be the opportunity for me in this generation, but I will uh, try my best to work on the path that will lead to that possibility in the future. Um, Uh, speaking about the future, I want to show you my museum of history. My museum of history is, um, uh, is, is, is a, it's a metaphysical history, so it's, it's not related to time, but it related to five stages in the realization of independence. So there are five stages. Let me walk you through uh, stage one. Okay, so in stage one, the subject has no ideological awareness. To its perception, it lives out of the frequency of ideology and the wish to make impacts on the world. Uh, second stage is called uh, slavery. In this stage, the subject recognizes the ideology, but at the same time, attempt to conform and, and deny the existence. The action of the attempt is usually directed to itself due to the, imp due to, due to the importance of making impact. The stage number three is called orphanage. In this stage, the subject recognizes the ideology, but it is unable to form an antithesis to it. It then utilizes any possible thing at hand to make an impact but it doesn't care what the impact might be and might, let, might lead to. In this stage, the subject lacks the consistent and conviction to itself. The stage four is called uh, revolution. In this stage, the subject recognizes the ideology and is able to form an antithesis to it. However, it lacks the language to articulate its own ideology and it has to utilize ideology that are foreign to itself. The subject deeply cares about the ultimate goal of its impact. Uh, the subject is hopeful and appears to be consistent to itself. And this is the last stage, stage number five. Uh, is, in this stage, the subject completes a comprehensive antithesis to its dependence. The antithesis becomes the thesis of its independence. The subject uh, project is ideology with its full aura that influences the world. It then becomes a world master. And that is a stage number five. Sorry, uh, I was wrong uh, with the positioning, but the stage number five is here. And from these five stages, I construct a museum of history with the people uh, who made it uh, to the top. Uh, for some reason, the uh, people here don't show up, but for me, Picasso is stay four, and all the uh, outsider artists, they, they work independently. They don't know each other. They're from different uh, 
spot of the history, but sometimes I feel like they, they, they make it, they have made it there, stage five. Okay, so uh, that's all my presentation. Oh, uh, this as well. Country X was named after Mancom X, and I use him as a pers the spokesperson for the decla declaration of my country X independence. Uh, thank you very much. Uh. Thank you. Uh, this was really fascinating. I'm sure there's a lot to unpack in the uh, discussion later on. And um, I would now like to ask uh, Elise Leung to stage. Um, she's born and raised near Melbourne, Australia, and graduated with a BFA in photography and video arts from Belgium in 2009. And after that, moving to Berlin, Montreal, Brussels, and finally settled here in Hanoi in 2016. And uh, currently, she's heading an NGO called Undecided Productions, focusing on arts and music. And um, as an art manager, she's concerned uh, with the de development of production and dissemination opportunities for young creators, particularly in the areas of ecology and gender. And I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to attempt to juggle three devices at once, so I may side down um, at one second. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you to RMIT for a dense day. It was quite, I was saying to Christine, it was quite spicy this morning with the questions, so um, hopefully we get some good discussions as well. I don't often sit down for such a long amount of time looking at a screen, so if you feel like you need to move around a little bit, feel um, completely free. Um, I'm not great at public speaking, so bear with me, because I might miss a few things. Hello. <laughs> and also, thank you to the interpreters who are doing a phenomenal job um, up until now with all of this, like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. Um, my name is Elise, uh, as you kindly introduced. I am French, Vietnamese, Australian. I've been living in Hanoi for the past seven years, since the 16th of November. Um, I am an arts manager and writer, and I um, agree that it is an uncelebrated and surprisingly sexy role. Um, I run an organization called Undecided Productions. We are um, alive since 11 years. Um, I started with a group of friends when I was living in Brussels in Belgium. I'll slow down. Brussels in Belgium. And we are registered as an ISBL, which is Association Sans But Lucrative. It's a not-for-profit. And we are finalizing the registration of an international non-government organization in Vietnam, uh, which might sound super boring. It is a little bit boring. But um, the interesting thing is that we're the only um, organization with the industry codes of arts and music in that little INGO world. Tiny round of applause from Rachel, thank you. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk to uh, talk you through two projects that we're currently running. Uh, one of them is called Live, Make, Share, and the other one is called The Women's Room. And I am, okay, I may need to sit down for this, where am I pointing? Okay. Let's make sure. Oops. So, uh, uh, um, live make sure is a um, art residency program. Um, it has been running since 2018 with a ginormous pause during COVID. Uh, we have welcomed about 30 artists ish to date. Um, the space is in a village called Hien Van, which is in the Bac Ninh province. Uh, it's about 30, 40 kilometers from Hanoi towards the east. Um, we welcome artists, both local and international, that may or may not have an interest in ceramics because we are in partnership with a ceramic studio called Hien Van Ceramics. Um, we, uh, the artists are welcome to apply to the program and they um, can stay for one to three months during the year. Um, these images are of our old living space, um, which was a horrifically romantic, beautiful ancient house um, in this huge garden. And uh, yes, as, like I said, yeah. 
horribly romantic. Our current house is much smaller and cuter. Um, I am living there now with a Swiss Vietnamese photographer called Mi Dien, um, who is doing a project about fire cuisine. Um, the next image is, I don't know where I'm pointing, it's just magically pointing. Uh, this is the ceramic studio. Um, it is not a craft village, importantly. Um, this ceramic studio was founded by um, artist who, artist and architect who unfortunately passed away this year called Bui Huai Mai. Um, it is his son that has taken over the management and his girlfriend um, of the factory. It has been around since the early 2000s, so relatively recent, um, comparatively to Batchang, of course. Um, they began the studio in order to restore um, temples around architectural, um, earthenware of architectural importance and um, also started to a little bit of homewares and now they're currently doing quite a bit of homewares and they have a shop actually on a street I cannot remember the name of but do ask me later and um, they do designs that are inspired from beginning of the 11th century of northern Vietnamese. It's specifically northern Vietnamese design. Um, they use the clay from Bat Chang and they um, have their own recipes of natural pigment enameling. Um, Live Make Share then is in my eyes a relatively simple project. It's really the three words of the name. Um, our first uh, our first objective, I guess you would say, is that we have to live together and so artists are invited to um, exist in the same living space. Uh, they uh, cook together, they discuss, they most likely do not know each other. Um, they are not in any obligation to collaborate artistically. Um, I don't know if many of you have spent time living in a Vietnamese village, but the life ...ness of it um, takes quite a bit of your day from the multiple markets and um, especially if you're deciding to cook with fire. And so main objective is to be um, kindly human to each other. And the second is we help as much as we can an artist if they are wanting to make something. And some artists are super curious to do ceramics. Um, this is Louise in the middle who um, took full advantage of the huge ceramic studio. There, it's not obligatory ceramic practice, so there has been also um, dancers, photographers, writers, urbanists, um, a whole plethora of things that I've probably forgotten. And there is also no obligation to make anything. Um, my hope is that uh, it's very much a project about experience um, and I have seen artists come through with their kind of results, tangible results of the residency may be seen um, quite a long time after their experience with us in Vietnam. So um, if somebody would like to try and make or produce, they are more than welcome to and we do our best, but it's not a, um, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, this last image is uh, a moment of sharing. So it was our last public event with, um, Sophie on the top left was one of the resident artists. There was three at the time, and we invited a busload of people from Hanoi to come out to the village and, um, and to m make a little bit of things together and also to have some guided walks around the village and so that the artists could explain a little bit about their experience in, um, in living there over the past few months that they had been there. And during that time, they had also... Um, made these, um, this is pigment paint that you can see in the front, I don't know if you can tell what that is. The powder is um, stone pigments and uh, we had also made some watercolour from the local flowers down near the water. Um, and up on the top is a cyanotype prints, so we had um, invited people to also gather um, gently objects from around on their walks in order to make their own cyanotypes. Um, it, was, it was a glorious day. Um, this is an example of um, an artist project. So 
This lovely human being on the left on the pink bike is a Filipino artist called uh, Neo Maestro, and he applied to the residency with an ongoing project um, researching ghosts and ghost stories. Um, he had previously done it in Korea, Korea, um, and a little bit the Philippines. And so his objective was to um, gather stories and to um, have a look at potentially some imagery that may have to do with mortality and passing through, um, passing through certain gates. Uh, he spoke to many, many people in the village and um, anyone that he could actually steal five minutes, he would ask them if they had an experience with, um, with ghosts in their lives. And, and he uh, wasn't quite sure what he wanted to m make, um, but he uh, did end up doing a short video and he did a little zine where he wrote out some of the stories that he had gathered. And um, this on the right is his, uh, one of his first ceramic pieces that was, um, th that is a dismembered hand. And that was after a story of one of the grandmothers in the village, I think. Um, so yes, that's just an example of what one person could do at Live Make Share. And, um, in attempting to bring relevance to the, the symposium, these are three images um, of where I believe is maybe the value in the project, is um, this transmitting of, uh, of, of knowledge and experience. It is, again, like a very artist experience-focused project. Um, to the left, we have four people having a delicious lunch. Um, on the bottom right, we have uh, Ba Mong Bik that um, you may or may not know, but she is a um, incredible human being, and I think she might be 94 this year, uh, and she's one of the first women to do the um, Fine Arts University in Hanoi. She is a painter, um, silk painting particularly. Um, she still does a little bit of sketching today, if you would like to know, and she's going very well. Um, to in front diagonal is her grandson, and so that is son that is now taking over the ceramic uh, factory, who is um, a wonderful person who is also incredibly inspired by his father and grandmother in attempting to continue to transmit northern Vietnamese culture in the ways that he um, sees as important. One of them is about uh, antique restoration of furniture. Um, he's also obviously part of the ceramics um, and is also a filmmaker. So is, uh, yeah, there's a, a lineage in the family that is very particular to trying to herald and celebrate Northern Vietnamese culture. Um, it's his girlfriend in front and she's also taken um, the reins in the management of the studio. And to your bottom left in this image is a <laughs> tall, lanky, handsome man. Um, his name is Victor Dumont, and he is the first um, artist to have done Live Make Share. He is a Belgian dancer and choreographer, and a currently a very important figure in the queer culture of, um, of Brussels. And he and, and Ba have an odd magical relationship where they're still like pen pals and they send each other little letters. They spent an uh, incredible amount of time together because Bar speaks French and so they were um, conversing a lot about their life experiences and there's of course um, huge cultural age gaps but there was a very um, beautiful shared curiosity about each other and that has been ongoing. And so in this, um, yeah, this is an example of how I imagine some kind of heritage, knowledge, experience passing on um, could be done in this program. Uh, to your right is also a, a similar context, Louise, that is, um, that is learning with Cham um, and Ba's assistance about certain imagery. And in the middle is Neo again um, with Hai, uh, who was the factory manager at the time, who was <laughs> desperately attempting to teach him how to make um, ceramics, which had mixed, uh, mixed results. Um, so that's Live Make Share. The Women's Room is the second project, and this is a new, uh, in incredible trial periods, it is uh, completely different. Um, so the Women's Room is a reading group project. Uh, for those that don't know reading groups, uh, reading groups are people that gather 
online or offline, and it's um, in order to discuss and experience texts. Um, there's a lot of different formats that reading groups can take, and some of them are more similar to book clubs, where you do your reading privately in advance before coming to an event, and it's just about the discussion of the text. There's others that are when you arrive into uh, the event, you're given a text and it's silent reading for a certain amount of time. May or may not be a discussion. Um, this project is uh, where the format is where there's a selection of different texts um, and we read out loud to each other. Um, and then there's a discussion about this um, in the end. The women's room is specifically about topics that are about or interesting to Vietnamese women. Um, and this is odd because it's a Facebook group. Um, it, essentially, this is a Facebook group at the moment in the way that it is presented publicly. So this is the archive of the documents that we would use in the reading group. Um, I'll just kind of quickly, if you would like to join our little group, then you're more than welcome. Um, so it's set out in different chapters. For example, I'm not sure if you can see this. So this is photo albums, and uh, one will be uh, on a very specific topic. So one of them will be Vietnamese women in photography. Um, there's another chapter that I'm working on now, which is women in Hanoi. Um, another one that is um, hi the hybrids and the homeless, which is about biracial um, Vietnamese-ness as a woman. Uh, so that's how it's presented as an image, and then you can download all of the documents. So one of the important things is that it's all um, open to be used by anyone if you're not able to physically go um, somewhere for the events, I mean, sorry. Um, yeah, and this is just another technical. So it will be the website link and the document link um, for, uh, for use. And the hope is that soon I'll also put a little like DIY how to do your own reading group event so that people could completely um, run with it if they would like to. Um, yeah, this is just an example of, of um, one of the documents that was a short story on DVAN that was about um, women in the mountains and women from the sea. Um, I'm gonna have to look at my notes. I don't remember what I wanted to say. So this project, yeah, in the way of how does that deal with um, heritage is, I had to take a moment to reflect on this. So the text that I gathered um, can be any kind of text. Uh, it's a book, an article, a blog, an interview, um, a, yeah, a research paper, um, anything that could be used in a context of reading out loud to somebody else. Um, they're often, texts that have actually been gathered by another organization. So I partner with people um, in order to value the work that they have already done. So one of the obvious ones is that I'll hopefully be partnering with the Vietnamese Women's Museum in order to explore their archives and their research work. Um, the next, um, there'll be also an event at Matka that will be about the photography. Um, so it's about giving life to existing archives that may or may not be um, public archives, um, but collections and valuing the work that has already been done by people in the way of um, producing texts in all those forms. Um, an example uh, of some of the things that we use um, in the chapter of women in Hanoi, uh, there is a book that was uh, just recently published by the Women's Publishing House. The, the Women's Union has a publishing house, in case you don't know. The book is downstairs, in case you want to get it. Um, it's called Women in Movement, and it's a research um, research book that you're nodding because you've seen it, um, about my, uh, the women that would gravitate towards Hanoi in order to become the street sellers of the vegetable and fruit. And so it's about the, um, the experience of that, uh, mostly contemporary, I think. The, the study was quite recent. Um, and that could be used at the same, uh, in the same event as reading a chapter of um, Look See by Wu Chom Fong. Thank you. Um, so, which was a, uh, it's an amazing book if you haven't read it. It's about a venereal disease. Amazing and venereal disease doesn't usually go together, but it is a super interesting book about the 1930s, I think it's mid-1930s, and how um, essentially STIs were being um, 
uh, were being present in Hanoi and had the relationship with the legality of prostitution and whatnot and how people were um, put away. And, and yeah, it's, it's super fascinating um, issues that have to do with, with gender in this city. Um, importantly, the, the women's room is not a writer's group, so the aim is not to produce new text at all. Um, yeah, it's not about gathering in order to make, it's about uh, gathering in order to discuss what has been um, thought in the past and to bring that discussion into something that is a little bit more contemporary as to like how is our personal reaction and experience um, about those texts. And it's quite, uh, I highly encourage, I made this might be your kind of jam, but if you ever see a reading group that is in your kind of topic, then uh, I really encourage you to go because it's incredibly surprising what comes out. Um, there are, yeah, I, there was an event with many friends involved and, and the discussion really went through like uh, slithers of things that was unexpected and it's super interesting and um, for those that spend a lot of time in closed room with women, it's a pretty like phenomenal uh, experience to do that. Um, and yeah, so in the way of, of heritage, I guess this has to do with uh, understanding and exploring together thoughts that have been thought in the past and potentially um, discussing how that could be relevant, irrelevant, or um, used in different formations uh, now. Um, yay, I made it through. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Elise. You're a rock star. You know, actually, the, the irony in these presentations is that it makes me wish that we'd reconsidered the naming of the theme, like, uh, rather than having it being like this, you know, creative intelligence, you know, the impact of creative intelligence. I think we should have called it the role of passionate, authentic, engaged humans that are interested in, you know, uh, perpetuating future heritage in Vietnam, because that's the consistent theme, like just this notion of humanness and that was just beautiful. I loved their presentation. Thank you. Okay, we have, now we have another one of our own who we have to be a bit nice to because he actually made it here today knowing yesterday he had a bit of a fall, but he's actually back. He's back because he's, a, he's not only a trooper, but uh, he wants to be here with us and share his work and ideas and we're very, very happy for that because he is... Another amazing, phenomenal human that uh, has a beautiful way of seeing the world through the lens of a camera. So, do you need the do you need the charger? Do you need your? No, Are you right? You ready? Yep. We're all connected. Okay. So this, uh, my friends, is Eddie Ryan, and Eddie Ryan is a photographer. He's also he just recently, actually, within a, is it a year? Within the last year, you've moved to. Ten months. I know he's a newbie, so he's just recently moved to Hanoi. But even within that period, you should see the plethora of photographs that he's taken in and around the area, which is just this amazing insight into how a uniquely special human being sees the world. So I really love looking at his photographs. They really inspire me on a on a really deeper level. But I just they make me curious, and I think that. When you're creative and someone else makes you curious through their work, that's a really powerful like thing to do. So, I'm sure you're going to share with us some <laughs> some of your gorgeous photographs today. Um, and I'm just going to hand over the mic to you because I think that you're best at describing your work. Thank you. Hi, folks. How are you? Um, I uh, just based on the last four presentations, uh, I am a rank outsider compared to what everybody else is doing. So uh, thanks for having me here today, <laughs> Rachel. Um, I'm, I'm now debating whether to show you the work at the end or not, but um, <laughs> we'll talk about some other things. Uh, so um, yeah, um, do I win the longest title award? For, for, for starters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, it's not quite so complicated, right? So I mean, the thing is, what 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 do we mean by post-documentary photography? Well, it's it's pretty straightforward, you know. Um, Walker Evans began this business of documentary photography with his uh, American Photographs series, um, and uh, pretty much established the thing. Uh, but then, as time goes on, you see people like Joel Sternfeld, then who kind of takes it up with American Prospects, um, and. Um, 
uses it more conceptually where he begins to talk about prospects in America as being uh, utopian or dystopian through the images that he's making. Um, so it, it shifts quite gradually um, and that's the kind of side of things that I'm on is that um, I, I like to think of myself maybe as a more conceptually biased image maker than uh, pure documentary. So um, two terms that I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with. I won't labor the point, right? But uh, two types of walking and making images. One is as a flaneur and one is the derivé uh, that uh, Guy Debord talks about. Um, in terms of flaneurism, it tended to be kind of a sort of a middle class pursuit, really, um, where people who had money and time could go and look at what was going on. Uh, and those that didn't have money and time, well, they had to get on with life in the real world. Um, whereas the drift, that's kind of something really that um, anybody can kind of get along with. But, you know, sorry, have I missed a slide there? I, no, I haven't. Okay. So walking um, and photography are synonymous. They go hand in hand. One doesn't happen without the other, you know. Um, but uh, there's a wonderful article from a couple of years back by um, Shane O'Mara, who is... Uh, neuroscientist in uh, Trinity College in Dublin um, and uh, the name of the article was uh, all about walking as a superpower you know um, you know and I mean Omara there says that from scientific literature that getting people to engage in any physical activity before they engage in a creative act is very powerful you know uh, and he's absolutely right I mean um, I, I always have my best ideas walking always there's really there's no other way of doing it for me you know and then this becomes you know, the, the dictaphone, or we make the notes as we go through, and you kind of write and think at the same time, uh, and then a camera just becomes the extension of that thinking and that walking. Um, so, uh, true. It's a fantastic article if you get to dig it up. It's um, actually well worth spending time with. So, um, in terms of the derivé, um, although you've been in your area of the city thousands of times before, it must never reflect on your past experiences and you have to let your surroundings absorb you if you're going to make um, accurate pictures of what it is you're thinking about in those areas at the time. Um, and in terms of um, flaneurism, I mean, you, you, you can say that using the derivé kind of gathers the same information, you know, in that, you know, you acquire empirical data about the place by actually being there, by being in it, um, by strolling, by looking, hearing, smelling, feeling. We take in all these things, we, 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 we process them, we work them out in the ideas that we're making images of. Um, and it's a combination of those factors, as it quite plainly says there, allied to the eventual writing up the data, often in the form of poetry, which defines a plan. Or we're, we're not talking about poetry here, obviously, we're talking about images, but the same thing applies. Um, many years back, uh, um, I, I kind of became a firm believer of using y your own cultural references, as everybody here today is doing uh, in the work that you're making. So I, I, I kind of found workable links between Irish traditional singing and making pictures, and there's a link between the two that sort of set me off on making other work that I'll show you as we go along. Um, so anyway, Eugene Ajay uh, was, uh, uh, he was kind of before Walker Evans in that he was out photographing the streets of Paris by day and night. Um, he was documenting everything, that this is how we have such a strong, you know, sort of understanding of how this place looked back in the day because of him. Um, and then uh, there's another shop called Brass Eye working so, uh, almost like the night shift at the same time, um, who was documenting night streets of Paris. Um, this is a documentary about it, a post-documentary. From here then we go into people like Robert Adams, um, who I hugely admire. Um, he, he, he started out with kind of a degree in English literature and then brought that to bear on the photographs that he, make, he made. Um, but, but this is a wonderful book that's just been republished by Mac no, it's not by Steidl, um, called uh, Summer Nights Walking. Uh, and he made it between 1976 and 1982, but he didn't publish it until 1985. It, it was let sit for a while, you know, and he used to wander, he used to walk the neighborhood that, it, that he, he lived in in California and made these amazing pictures of it as it was, with kind of something to say about the community, the environment that he found himself living in. Um, so uh, from there, these are 
pretty much kind of people who are on the outside looking in, pretty much my position here in Hanoi at the minute. I'm very much outside and I'm looking in, so um, I, I, I have a lot to learn. <laughs> but um, Gregory Halpern's approach then to making pictures really is pure post-documentary um, and uh, a bit of a loose cannon way of working, but he, he manages to pull it together in that um, uh, this book, particularly Zizix, which is, um, it, it, it won a number of awards a couple of years back, but um, he sp spends his time kind of walking um, and making images and making images and making images and then eventually accumulating them. And then he'll kind of decide or work out through editing and through sequencing what the actual work is about, uh, which is risky, <laughs> but he gets it to work. It's good, you know. Try it sometime if you're ever behind the camera. See how long it takes, because uh, it, it takes him quite a bit to work it out, but he, he gets there. Um, also, a very famous body of work, Todd Hedo's House Hunting. Um, if you ever get to listen to Todd Hedo speak about this body of work, do, because it's, he is so generous in how he describes it, how he talks about it. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, um, again, this happened from being outside and being in the environment, um, b b being in the place and gathering data. And he just began to photograph houses at night and he began to put it together and then he began to realise that if the window light was on upstairs and window light was on downstairs, that may speak about the relationship that's happening in that home. And then he began to realise that what he was photographing uh, was about his own early life and his own early home situation. And he began to work that out through the images. Um, there astonishing, as is he. Um, so again, this is all outside looking in. Um, Stephen Shore's American Surface is, is a, uh, another book that um, kind of resonates with me at the minute because I'm here such a short time and because I'm learning really from kind of making images of surfaces that I don't quite understand yet. So I'm photographing them and I'm putting them together and I'm seeing what I'm working out from there, you know. Um, and w William Crawford's work I came across for the first time at the um, Photography Biennial here in Hanoi earlier this year. Um, one of the first people to kind of come back into the country in the mid 80s with a camera do uh, documenting um, life as it was then. Um, what intrigues me about the image on the left is that there are still kind of windows like that with the seats outside here in Hanoi. And it didn't dawn on me until I saw that image and walked past within the street going, oh, they're still being used, it's great, you know. But it looks like a different world, it's a different time, you know. But again, it's a great archive of how things were. I was very interested in the part of the conversation I heard before lunch where, you know, uh, there are things that people would like to see the back of in Hanoi, I thought that was fascinating, you know. Um, and, you know, I, always, I also thought it might be fascinating to have an archive then of things that people want to get rid of, and then it's into an archive and gone, then it's out of the way, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know how these images are viewed in Vietnam, you know, but um, as, a, as a snapshot of the time, I think they're particularly powerful. Um, do I need to say anything about this? I don't think I do. Greg Girard. <laughs> I'll just stop there. I'm sure you all know it. You know, It's the book that brought me to Vietnam in the first place, was this book. This is why I ended up coming here, was, was this. Um, and a more recent one, um, Gianpaolo Arena's A Folk Tale from Vietnam, published by, uh, I can't remember. But this is the newest one. You know, So I mean, I'm seeing lots of people outside looking in. I'm not seeing so many people looking out, apart from the four people I know who do. Um, and two of them are here today. <laughs> so, um, you know, there they are, Ling and Ha. Yeah, they're up next, right? And the other two, Wen and Hai Thang. Um, so the thing is, archival meaning and interpretation, why do we need to have an archive of the continual present? Why do we do it, you know? I mean, um, I do it because it eventually builds into projects that talk about very particular experiences at very particular times and places that may be worth keeping so we can go back over them again in years to come. Um, one project is this, uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to show this at Matka a couple of months back. Um, here it is called The Weight of Things. Um, outside of here it's, it has a different name, that's okay. Um, but um, this all became about sort of decoding a very obvious landscape and a very obvious cityscape. Um, I chose to live in a very particular place in Dubai for a number of years to work out this project. Um, and uh, it became very easy to kind of uh, decode that environment 
um, and say what I needed to say about the lives of migrant workers in the city through, uh, through kind of making very quiet photographs that knew exactly what they were about. So um, this is what I thought was a gaff tree wasn't. It's actually a summer tree, and it's to do with the making of honey in the mountains in Ras al-Khaima. Um, and I began to think about how workers get attracted to these places where, you know, life seems to be wonderful, and there's lots of money available, and it's, you know, honey to the bee and all the rest of it, but they're going into something that they don't quite realise isn't quite as it's painted. So from here, um, you know, we're looking at kind of architecture, architectural pieces in the desert. It is almost a cliche in that it is meant to be a mirage and that you know it's kind of neither here nor there half in half out um half full half empty not incomplete yet the foundations are there um into um how life is actually can be for these people in that you have a guy there working a laundry he will work 12 hours a day seven days a week for two years then he gets to go home for a month he comes back he does it all over again just to keep his family going and the shirts on the right hand side in that you know there are there are these shirts that these migrant workers buy that they will uh, you know there was always be somebody coming through to fill those shirts somebody will always be there to buy them and this goes on and on and on um also there is kind of um a very sort of fine moral fiber that keeps the place in touch this kind of line device went through a lot of the through maybe eight or nine of the images in in different in different ways um and on the right hand side, it's kind of pulling from the visual environment. Uh, like you get these modesty stickers placed over parts of the body that shouldn't be on display in places like the Virgin Megastore, you know, like album covers and things that put a big black sticker over the things that you shouldn't be able to see. And I thought it was a useful sort of device to use if people have a blind spot towards the precariousness of life in that city when uh, it runs on a continual cycle of three years of repatriation or renewal, you know. Uh, so. There you go. So it's using, I mean, all these things are in the environment. It's easy to assemble it then into a sort of a more coherent, conceptual sort of way of talking about these lives, you know. Um, that sort of transitional light uh, passing across these blocks that are built specifically for migrant workers and then the things that keep them there, you know. Some people manage to accumulate a lot of debt during their time in the country. Then they can't leave if it isn't paid, understandably. Um, so there's the decision to stay, the decision to go, you know, but you'll always be sort of fish or flesh. You'll never be one thing or another. You, you, you know, you, you can't stay there. And if they want you out, you're gone within a month. That's kind of how it works, you know. So um, it's a pretty subtle piece of work. But uh, to see it in its entirety, it maybe makes a bit more sense. But um, it was great to work on it. And then I left. <laughs> then I left the UAE. So then I hit Hanoi. And as you can see, I'm very happy to be in Hanoi. <laughs> If I was a little more professional, there'd be flags and not hearts. But anyway, there you go. These are a lot of the locations I've spent time in recently and where I'm, uh, things I'm looking at and, and, and working with, um, you know. Uh, so it's been a busy 10 months. Uh, I'm, I'm getting to know your city very well because if it's one thing I love doing, I love walking a city and getting to know it, getting it into my head, you know, so I have the, the, the memory of, well, that's there, that's there, that's there. I, then I just go back and redo and reshoot whenever I need to do that. Um, what's coming next? Oh, yeah. So um, these were one of the first things to very much intrigue me when I got out and about. And that there, you, you know what they are from here. The community notice boards. I don't need to go on about them. You know what they talk about, what they tell us. They tell us everything. <laughs> very frankly, uh, on occasion. <laughs> um, and uh, so I began to run a, an initial body of work here called "Until Everything Became Familiar," right? Which is you know go out and photograph things that I don't understand and put them all together until I do understand them uh, and find my way in that way. Um, I did an equivalent project in the Middle East and that ended up being called Grace Notes where I was looking at kind of spaces between things because I was dealing with the element of kind of being between, you know, where, you know, you're not permanent, you're not naturalized citizen, you're not permanent, so you're, you're between those things and that kind of let me in to uh, working out the, long, the longer term project on migrant workers. So, um, what was I saying? Uh, yes, uh, anyway, surface readings and surface enlightenment, okay, fine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can, if, if we kind of tip back to 
shore is American surfaces. I'm, I'm, I'm purely reading the surface of the city here, you know, and uh, things that kind of catch my attention, I'll find out more about. I need to do a lot more reading on Hanoi. I need to do a lot more reading on, you know, kind of society here. I need to understand it a whole lot more, but this is my way of working into that, you know. What else is coming up here? Oh, yeah, okay. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, the culture of repair uh, rather than throw out, you know, you know, it's it's wonderful to see things being fixed rather than being slung. It's great. Um, you know, I mean, there's a project in this in itself in the typology of motorbike ramps, you know, and many, many things that they're made of. Um, but also the kind of fixing and the can do thing where, you know, the, the canopy will be attached to the ramp with closed pegs, you know, and, you know, just how to make the most out of something is what I love about, well, part of what I love about here too. Um, and then kind of this is going way back to a very early project I did. And then you start finding these things here and you go, oh yeah, okay. Um, so it's old ideas and new territories. Uh, and then <laughs> the next one, <laughs> yes, this, okay. When I got here first, th th these are uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved seeing on the footpaths in the city, um, because I think they are, like, okay, that looks a bit huge, but um, in, in actuality it was quite small, but I love how perfectly packaged domestic refuse is and put out on the pavement. It's so respectful in terms of how it's done, you know, and I, I think it's a measure of kind of respectfulness of people in the place that they will do this and put it out respectfully. So, you know, uh, and that's one of the many things that I love about footpaths here too, is how this is done. Um, and also, I'm also intrigued by this, uh, I had a conversation recently with a, a colleague, you know, going like, you know, I mean, the things are still fresh. They're less than 24 hours old. We're out in the street by the end of the day, you know. And uh, again, there's just, you know, things that just intrigue me and make me smile. I go, what's that? What's that? And then eventually you kind of put together kind of a whole little series of things that, you know, um, Saul Leiter was sort of described as uh, fragments of an incomplete world is what these images like these become, you know. Um, and... Uh, yeah, this is from last weekend. Um, and uh, I think this image I made in August, and it's kind of stayed with me since, uh, mainly because of the color, that saffron color, being the color of enlightenment where Buddhism is concerned, you know. So I think maybe with this set of pictures, all I'm trying to do is kind of um, reach that state of enlightenment through reading the surfaces to start with, and then hopefully I'll get into a further project once I kind of find my way in properly and find something more interesting maybe to talk about. Okay, so uh, you can follow the project on Democratic Light on my website. You can see how it progresses. I update it about every six weeks if there's new things to make. And uh, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Edward. Um, this was really interesting. Um, it also resonates with me personally and with my own practice as a photographer. For me, all of my projects also start with walking the city. I think it's an amazing way to um, get to know a new place, get to know an old place, a place that's familiar with you. And uh, it also reminds me of an online class I took a few years ago with a German filmmaker, Werner Herzog. And uh, the first assignment was get out of your house and walk 100 kilometers in any direction and just take notes of it. I didn't end up doing the assignment because I didn't have time for it, but I think the idea that uh, walking is like really an amazing way for us to connect with a space and try to understand it better, even it might stay superficial at the first um, point, but I think that's also like one of the first steps to, to collect that future heritage we're talking about. Um, so like a journey into the world of photography. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce now uh, both uh, Ha and uh, Lin from uh, Matka. Um, and um, basically, uh, if you think about contemporary photography in Vietnam, you have to think of Matka, uh, the photo collective and art space that they established is, um, yeah, like a resemblance of like the contemporary very Vietnamese photography culture. Um, both of them have like so many achievements, so I will not list them out, but both of their work is um, published internationally in museums and great magazines. And um, I think let's just hear from them uh, about the great work of Matka. Thank you. <laughs>
Hello. Uh, so thank you very much for being here today, and uh, it's, it's, it warms my heart to see a lot of uh, friends around here, and it, it has been uh, so inspired, you know, to hear all of the conversations and all the the topic you said later, uh, yeah, earlier. So today I just want to talk because me myself I'm a photographer. We start speaking photography right now, and the topic today is publishing photography as letters to the future, which is like one part of the bigger body of work that we've been continually working on for the last couple of years. So, yep. Oh, oh, sorry, here's the thing. Marcas, that's the name of our project. And here's the physical place that we got from uh, 2019. So me, myself, I'm a Ling Farm. I'm a professional photographer. I'm working in the field of documentary and, and journalism, and I've been covering the, the region of Southeast Asia for the last uh, uh, 12 years, I've been continuing, you know, like like traveling and 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 then covering everything from from conflicts, crisis to one Disney, you know, and and, and to everything in between red carpet. And here's Ha, my uh, partner in crime. Hi everyone, my name is Ha. I'm a photographer and artist. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I get really anxious when I ask to you know introduce my personal practice, but basically, uh, um, my practice currently. In, um, incorporates photography and multimedia and it explores uh, stories of love on the margin. Um, since 2016, uh, I've been uh, co-running Matka with Ling, uh, often as a managing editor, um, curator, uh, publisher, uh, sometimes by, by, by chance and sometimes by force. Oops. That, that's Vietnam, you know, that's, that's what I just Googled Vietnam a couple of months ago. So the thing why I started Matka is that the story went by, you know, when I started doing my photography, because I was looking for a, a, a sort of uh, like a channel of resources where I can, I, I, I can see, you know, what's the opportunity. And then at the same time, I was looking for a mentor, someone that I can just like follow and learn the craft from. But... Unfortunately, I, I, I found none, you know, so I, I got to be out there in the world by myself, trying to self-learn a lot of things, you know. And then, and then at the same time, I, I, I tried to do a lot of research about Vietnamese photography, and actually this is what I found. You know, and then our, like, like my biggest teacher was, was, was Google, you know, because I'm, I'm from Justin Bieber generation, you know. And then, but then, but then at the same time, uh, I, I just keep exploring photography, and I just figure out that if you remember this thing, the Vietnam War, which is the first major war ever, that's, you know, if you're a housewife somewhere in America, you know, you know what's going on on television. It's about the war. But at the same time, if you look at the narrative of the Vietnam War, it was technically was told by mostly the American, you know, and partly by the European, which is considered as, like, the side which is defeated, but at the same time, you know, I have a lot of questions. Who are the Vietnamese photographers covering the war, you know? Who are they? And even like before them, you know, like who, like, like, what is Vietnamese photography, you know? And who are like my photographers? And, I, and, 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 and to the point that I keep learning photography and, and, and I, I just realized that I know more about those household names out there, you know, mostly American, European, rather than, than like, like our Vietnamese photographers. And then it just led me to that, that curiosity that, that I, I, I need to solve by myself. And also, Sao to Architect Chung, you know, he mentioned something that we don't really have access to our big archive, you know. And then and, and, and archive, if you talk about archive, you know, like, and, and, and modern history archive, most of the time, you know, it's going to be photography. And so, and so that's, that's when I start, you know, like, I start trying to get my hands on all of the information that, that I, 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 I can reach out to and then try to speak to as many people as possible. And that's the day I started Matka seven years ago on uh, 2016, when I, start write, I, I started Matka as the blog. And I, I, I just keep writing, I just keep you know, like asking friends to this guy know the other guy, you know, and then I, I just try to enlarge my network of photographers or like people have produced some work out there. And I, I, I just keep writing some feature about them. And then, but, but then what, I, I, what I was really, really clear in the beginning that the site must be bilingual. Firstly, I want to do this in Vietnamese, you know, that's, you know, first to serve my 
community, first to serve my people, but at the same time, it needs to have an English version in order to, to, you know, like for the world to see what's, what's happening here, you know, just to break out of those stereotypes. But then also, like recently, I just got a conversation with a scholar friend. He's like one of the really prominent researchers in, on, on, on Southeast Asia photography right now. He just mentioned to me something that, hey, the position of Matka has been elevated. I'm like, in which way? You know, we we just like a bunch of kiddos, you know, <laughs> trying trying to figure things out. So he just told me something that you guys start becoming a point of reference because you know, like even in Southeast Asia photography right now, you don't have anything equivalent to Matka. You know, like no one is talking about Indonesian photography. You know, no one is talking about Filipinos. Of, um, photography. So that's why, you know, like, like we, we, we start hosting a lot of researchers, scholars coming in and then start working with us. And that's when, when uh, Han joined me very early on, you know, later in, in 2016, uh, first as a, a writer, a contributor, but right now uh, she's our editor in chief and uh, at the same time she's our project manager. Thanks. Um Oh my God, like, <laughs> sorry, like, I mean, it, it looks so simple on the surface, you know, it's a website, so what else, but um, there's so much that could have been touched on. For example, Ling mentioned uh, fighting stereotypes. Uh, yes, I mean, there's definitely an aspect in that uh, because um, even though like photographs of the Vietnam War were excessively collated and studied in Western ac academia, um, there's, you know, very little interest. Um, in studying, you know, what has come out of Vietnam as the country tries to heal and move on from the war. Um, so, yes, you know, there's a definitely an aspect in uh, not really fighting stereotypes because, you know, as a local born and bred Vietnamese, that's not really like my first and foremost concern. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning that um, everything that we do is built as a clear response, you know, to the lack of infrastructure, um, you know, to see photography, to learn photography, to talk about photography in Vietnam, and uh, simply because there wasn't any, you know, say museum or center for, for photography or like even a bookstore, a library, it's impossible to see photography. And without seeing the actual images, how do you talk about photography? Um, because our entire, the entirety of our um, a colonial archive is housed in Western, often European institutions. We do have an archive uh, in the Vietnam News Agency that is technically a public institution, but it's almost inaccessible by the public. Um, and then, for example, like taking the form of a website, right? It's uh, technically open and accessible to everyone with an internet connection. Um, it's simply, you know, what we're doing was to try and record and collate uh, a lot of works and conversations so that these can be um, accessed, you know, like by other people in the future. Um, and I think it's important to mention accessibility as, you know, like a key thing that keeps running around, you know, the many projects that we do, either online or offline, you know, in person. Um, because, um, you know, as I mentioned, like the lack of a, a gathering space. So what happened was, you know, a group of photographers would hang out and they would show work, often in, you know, very casual gathering spaces, like a cafe, a beer garden. Uh, but if you're not like friend of a friend of a friend, then it's very hard, you know, like to access these kind of clicks. And that's actually what happened with Ling and I. Um, and yeah, so like I, I was, you know, you know, when working on these features, the interviews that focus on the photographer's practice and process, um, you know, like I was thinking of, okay, maybe that's a way to sort of record these conversations so that they can be accessed and also even challenged in the future. But at the same time, like, you know, it's the act of opening up the conversation to virtually everyone. And then by working with photography, we finally come to the part that we start having to produce our own publication. Because it's like, as an artist, you know, we were born and raised here in, in, in Hanoi, Vietnam, very often, you know, the idea is that people just keep telling me, just, just don't ever think about of, of like, like having a book because of all the censorship and because of all of the production kind of like challenges, you know, and also like a lot of, a lot of issues around that. But then, but then like I, I was growing up with the sense that people just 
just keep telling me, you know, just just forget about that idea, you know. That's 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 an, a thing that you 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 don't think about anymore, you know. But but then but then but then if if you talk about photography, publishing is still like one of the main medium, and and and, and photo book is still like you know like like one of the the the, the key kind of like way to see photography, and that's when we started to have an imprint in uh, 2019, which we call. Market, which is we we borrow the French word market, you know, which is like something is is ongoing, something that we don't even want to call it a book, we don't want to call it a, a booklet or whatever. We're just trying to experiment the possibility of publishing here in Vietnam in on those constraints, you know. But I do believe constraints breed creativity, and that's what we've been doing with this project of, of this uh, publishing project. So that's the day I, I, I start gathering a lot of friends, designer friends, you know, production friends, and also banker friends, you know, just to have to, 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 to join this thing together and just trying to, to borrow a little bit of, of, of this and that, you know, and then just trying to, to, to form up a team and then just try to publish our first book. But then, but then carry on until now we have like maybe like four books w within our portfolio. But then at the same time, I just visit one of our uh, publishing uh, friends in, in Switzerland and they produce, you know, like 25 books per year. But here I produce one book in two years, you know, or like even more than that. And, 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 and that's, the thing that, that's what's happening to us here in, 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 in the local context. Yep. So I mean, it's um, you know we want the books to be available in Vietnamese and English. Um, we focus on local and lesser known stories um, through all about photography, and also we want the books to be produced and distributed legally in Vietnam. Um, and you know, I felt like you know if we touch on censorship, then you know like everybody, would, I mean like it's cold, and you know like I'm kind of hungry, so maybe next time it's another conversation. <laughs> But then, but then uh, it's funny because like we start working with we start working on a lot of collaboration funded by, you know, like foreign institute, you know, and we start having our partners and so on. But many times, once we start coming to the conclusion of the project, we have to produce a publication, right? And that's the day they realize that oh my God, it's like double amount of effort, double amount of time, double amount of like money invested, double amount of like production costs and everything because it must be bilingual, you know? But we do fight for that, you know? We don't accept the fact that it only, it's not gonna be like only in English or French or whatever, you know? Our priority is like that thing must be written in Vietnamese first, you know, so, yep. Yep, um, and I guess like why we're doing all that, um, running website, uh, operating a physical space in Hanoi, um, and also publishing. Uh, there are something else that we have been doing, kind of under the under the ground. Uh, that is to build a collection, um, and this is like entirely what you see here is about like 50, 500 plus books um, that are bought, you know, with you know our own money and um, just out of personal interest. And uh, while well, it started as you know like something that we loved to do, uh, but then gradually uh, after a couple of years. Uh, we realize that um, you know there's a, you know some specific areas of interest um, when it comes to collecting books. For example, we do look for books that um, have something to do with Vietnam and focusing on books produced by um, Vietnamese nationals and also um, books that are that talk about like certain narratives that have been um, left out of the mainstream narrative. Um, I mean, because there's a lack of funding, obviously, uh, but at the same time, there's a lack of a th like proper historical theoretical framework, and you know this just this lack of things. I think at the same time, it creates it opens up a certain sense of freedom, you know, to just amass whatever we think is visually interesting, and so um, we don't really discriminate um, any types of photography. So we collect, say, monographs, um, books published by the state, uh, propaganda materials, and even what are uh, categorized under like the ephemera uh, category. Um, you know, if, if these were part of like a museum collection. So things like postcards, uh, albums, you know, more vernacular stuff, uh, sometimes negatives. 
And, and it's just out of our curiosity and out of our interest. We try, like me myself, I'm trying to have my hands on everything that I could, you know, that visually interesting to me. So right now, I think we house in-house at least 100 kilograms of negative, positive films, catalogs, and then everything for toffee produced in Vietnam. But we don't even have time and the resources to really like dig through those and trying to build something out of those yet. So that's why, like yesterday, I just asked my intern to spend like 20 minutes to like scan something and to put up on the slide. But then we have boxes and boxes just like putting in our studio at the moment. Untouched. Um, this is from a recent project, uh, also supported by the British Council. Uh, I call it the unofficial archive, uh, which is a, a showcase and also a reading room. So these are all original materials that I brought to the BOP Books on Photography Festival um, in Bristol, UK. It is like an annual festival on photo books organized by the Martin Parr Foundation uh, and the Royal Photographic Society. And the idea was to um, introduce a selection of our collection um, of books that have materials, printed materials that have led in interesting lives because all of these materials have been bought um, in quite an unconventional way because, as mentioned, we don't really have a bookstore where you can, you can just go and just pick and choose whatever you want. Um, you have to specifically be on the hunt for this kind of materials, uh, not just because you know, these are like expensive or collectible items, simply because there's such, you know, it's, they've just been like left in the shadow and neglected. And so in order to look for these materials, you have to go online. You have to go to second-hand stores. Sometimes you have to look on eBay and Amazon and ask someone else to hand carry the books back to you because simply shipping books to Vietnam is just a task that's just too costly and almost impossible. Um, and so here, um, there are books that are produced within 1950s um, until 2000s. And there are a couple of books, uh, contemporary books, um, that uh, deal with the legacy of photography in Vietnam. And the materials are also quite diverse. So we have, um, say, um, a catalog of uh, an international photo exhibition uh, hosted by a Ting Vo Photography Club, which is a, a club hosted um, by, run by Chinese photographers in Chợ Lớn, Saigon, in the year 73. Um, we have, uh, for example, Vietnam, Our Beloved Land. It's a monograph by Nguyễn Cao Đàm and Trần Cao Lĩnh who are considered like the pioneering art, photography, art photographers in Saigon. Um, and there are also, you know, vernacular stuff uh, that we think is so valuable, such as um, a set of postcards by um, a local studio called Hà Tien Photo, uh, run by Vietnamese photographer Quách Ngoc Ba, uh, based in um, Hà Tien, a small town neighboring Cambodia. And so, I mean, like just by collating and being able to look at these materials, then I believe you know that is the very first step towards actually understanding our history. And um, yep, these are what we plan to do in the next near future if we can continue to exist. I mean, <laughs> um, the existence of you know independent, self-funded initiatives are so fragile. Uh, and unpredictable, and so like, just take whatever we just share with you with a grain of salt. And yeah, at the same time, we we, we start having a collaboration with all type of, of, of creative people, all kind of uh, of organization and institution around the world. And uh, but uh, we, with the missions that we just gonna we just gonna. You know, like 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 share our perspective on on Vietnamese photography. At the same time, trying to share our resources that we've been just gathered by ourselves, as, uh, and then also our understanding and, and and knowledge. You know, just to put it out there to the world, just to have a conversation with with with, with everyone out there if you're interested. So, yep. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lin and Ha. That was, that was so fascinating. OK, so um, now we've got our questions um, series. So we're going to, yes, grab some chairs. One second.
join us or <laughs> we have a seat for you <laughs> all right um, are there any questions in the audience Ooh, silent. <laughs> yeah, uh, because I know that you guys really rare and, and bold among the creative community in Vietnam for last uh, seven or eight years since I know. Of. And I still remember the first time when I met you, you mentioning about trying to build a website legally. Approved website, so but I just check and it's not yet. So, what is going on with that? Hello, come on, Chiha. Thank you very much for 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 the the questions. <laughs> um, so this is um, yeah, this this the thing because um. At first, you know, I, uh, when I started, I just want to do everything as legal as possible, you know. And I was looking for a way to officially declare and register my website and my content with the authority, you know, in a way to protect it, but in a way that, you know, I'm, I'm going to do things that on the bright side, you know. And, <laughs> But then, but then, but then, after a while of researching, I, I couldn't figure out like like how this 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 fragile online content, which category is gonna belong to, you know, which part of like creative right, you know, like like this thing is gonna protect, you know, and then and then it was like I, it took me a year to figure out like like like. How it's gonna be, you know? Like, like I mean, I I I, I own the domain and I own, own the. You know, I'm, I'm talking about publishing, right? You know, like like how you could publish legally, you know, and uh, as the kind of like a public, a public online publishing channel. But then uh, after a year, I just gave up, you know, because it's just too confusing and there's no there's no direct answer. And actually, I I seek out to some of the agents, you know, some of the middlemen trying to ask for. The, the, the consultation, the, what's going on? And then the guy, he just told me that, oh, all right, you just do your things, you know? Once you reach one million followers, someone is gonna reach out to you, you know, and just make it work with you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so right now, we just, we only reach 10,000 followers or something, you know? So it's not that yet, we have a long way to go. So, but uh, thanks for the questions, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions in the audience? It's a quick question. Thank you, everybody, for your presentations. Um, Mr. Ling, I have a question for you. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, sorry to, to direct it back at you. And it's really such an amazing initiative that you have, so I really appreciate learning about it. Um, I wonder if you can say a little bit about your relationship with the recent uh, museum at Salah, and if you're connected at all, because they're doing a lot of similar kinds of initiatives of, or, I'm sorry, Lysa. Um, oh. Lysa. Sorry, Lysa, if you're connected with that project at all, and I was just out there um, visiting, right. and um, they're kind of doing similar things in terms of like creating an archive and, and digging deep, but even going further back into right. colonial right. history. So I'm wondering your relationship there, and I'm basically thinking if there are different groups who are kind of building these archives, how might you then collaborate? Um, because even VNA ha does have an amazing archive, and they might be interested in being kind of drawn into your project. So I'm just wondering about larger collaborations, not internationally, but but here within Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, Sorry, I just because you just asked me, but then <laughs> I just want to I, first. Firstly, I just want to to answer like your your question about my relationship with Lisa. You know, I'm a student. I'm an uh, observer. You know, so so I'm I'm, I'm, I'm keep looking to them and. and we, we, we do have collaboration now, I'm trying to support, but, but at the same time, they do provide a lot of insights and a lot of like, knowledge as well. But then, uh, yeah, kind of yeah, I can answer the question because I work quite closely with um, the first book that we did. We didn't really introduce it, but it's called, uh, it's called Market One, uh, Vietnamese Toffee Village, and the story is exactly about Lysa. And so what we did was um, in 2018, the museum opened, and that was like, you know, that was the coolest thing ever, you know, because for the first time in Vietnam, there was a photography museum, but it's unlike any other museum because it's run and founded by villagers of Lysa, 
and I thought that was so, you know, um, genuine, uh, and I was very touched by all the efforts, you know, like to collect materials, collect um, items, and, 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 you know, to try and, um, I guess, sort of um, and share a piece, you know, of history of photography, but also of the nation to the wider audience. Um, and so what we did was throughout 2018 to 2019, uh, we um, contacted and interviewed um, many descendants from Lysa, uh, because, you know, like for those of you who don't know, Lysa is a small village outside of Hanoi, uh, where uh, studio photography was born. So there was an, a man called uh, Nguyen Ding Khanh, and he's often credited as the founding father of uh, photography in Vietnam, and he learned photography from a Chinese studio and then went on and taught all the skills to his um, villagers. Um, and that was in the late 19th century. And so um, we can only talk to the descendants, uh, and most of them are actually quite old right now. Uh, and so what we did was um, to do interviews and uh, scan some materials, uh, take photographs wherever possible, because there's a sense of urgency to it, you know, because as mentioned, a lot of the people we interview are quite old, and actually last year, um, a, f a few people have passed away, actually. Um, there was uh, 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 the craftsman Nguyen Ding Hung, who specialized in water colorizing photographs, and also there was a man, uh, Nguyen Ba Mo, uh, who uh, shot, you know, beautiful studio photographs of uh, celebrities in Saigon uh, that have passed away. And so, I mean, um, yep, so that's our relationship with the Lysa Museum. I'm not really sure about the stage of um, the museum at the moment because even though they have, um, a, a, you know, like original collection, but it seems to be, they seems to be suffering from a lack of um, institutional funding and support. And so that's why they couldn't really have like public programming and you know, um, and things like asking people to activate the archive and things like that. I'm not really sure. Um, Dr. Nguyen Van Hui, who founded the museum, I'm sure he's very busy and his heart is in Lysa, um, but I, mean, I don't really know what's happening at the moment. Thank you. We need to look for the possibility of Any other questions? I was just interested on the website. So, Chung Mei, what what are you doing? You you've you've offshored. Is that what how you approached it? Uh, well, uh, we have the website, but uh, <laughs> uh, the same problem. We we we. We don't have a legal status uh, in Vietnam uh, so far, um, but uh, we are actually uh, registered in um, in France as an uh, association. Uh, I'm trying to deal with a uh, you know uh, with a legal problem here to uh, yeah um, to have a a proper uh, organization in Vietnam, but uh, so far. Everything that uh, like we we have a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, like inter international institution and uh, uh, universities, but uh, so far we don't have any problem uh, without you know a, a structure a legal structure. So uh, that's why I kind of still delay that process. But uh, yeah, after that maybe I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my uh, a milestone that I, I set for myself. But uh, we, we have the website link. Okay, we have a website. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you all for your insightful um, talks. Uh, I have a question for Elise and Pao. So, um, um, yeah, I think like uh, coordinating, hosting, organizing, it's something um, that I'm very involved with that n next to my creative practice. And I believe that you also have individual personal creative practices, maybe next to the projects that you talked about today. And I was just wondering 
how they kind of like those two aspects bleed into each other in your in your like in in, in your practice like how do your community engagement and 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 the hostship that you're uh, providing for others inform maybe like your individual um, projects um thank you so much for the question um son it's a really um Nice one to be asked about your own kind of creative practice. Um, I have learnt a lot from um, helping with the facilitations of these cross-cultural collaborations, as well as other projects that I'm um, kind of doing all the you know administrative kind of hosting work on. Um, and one of the biggest things that I've learnt that I've applied to my own practice is um, caring for people, listening and caring for people. Um, with my creative practice at the moment, uh, creative practice and research, I do a lot of uh, participatory work, um, working a lot with people, working a lot with my Vietnamese Australian community. Um, and so when I'm listening to the people that I'm working with in the other projects, what they need and addressing those needs and concerns, it helps me kind of plan in advance for the projects that I'm going to deliver in my own creative projects so that those things don't arise. Um, yeah, that's my main kind of takeaway. Mm, is this working? Um, oh. I don't know how to answer this. Um, I feel that um, that my existence as an art labourer is incredibly fluid. Um, I work with friends. Um, I discuss work a lot with my partner. Um, a lot of the actions as a facilitator or residency host are much more about just being a decent human being to somebody else that is sharing your space. So is that work? Maybe, um, but it's also just being a um, working on being present and human and there is a lot of you know there's a lot of discussion and, and theorizing as to what is your limit of your work and your personal life and I have absolutely no idea how I would define that my personal practice um, is much more in writing than anything else I studied photography but I don't practice photography so much um, and there are I guess many moments of complication or um, someone recently called me an octopus because I, I, I'm interested in an artist's work and I'll bring them to the residency and I kind of shoot them out and they're like re doing some research that I'm really interested in and I'm at the same time kind of analyzing their personality and how they're dealing with it and perhaps this character becomes a character in the writing that I'm doing later. So it, it's, a, it's kind of cyclical perhaps. Um, and I wouldn't be able to define, like, this is, this is my work and this is um, something that is personal, um, which is potentially a problem, I don't, I don't know. I also enjoy my work. Um, there is a, the unfortunate side of the administration that has to do with an incredible amount of emailing and actually having to learn Excel at some point, like as much <laughs> as you want to like be like, hey no, I can totally do this in my head and no, you do you know you need to know how to do a budget. Um and also in, in the way that you would, might like use social relations. Like the, there's sometimes I get a little bit of an eek when um, a friend will be, you know, having a co casual conversation and be like, oh, could you check this thing? And then you open a document, it's like 15 pages long and it's terrible. And you're like, oh, no, this is work. This is definitely work. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit complex, but it's also potentially um, we share some thoughts about the commodification of your cultural identity and how that's a personal journey that I think we all have to go through at some point as to like, do I have to talk about um, my different cultural heritage in my work? Do I use another name in order to talk about something else? Um, I'm currently with a, an artist that is really struggling with representation um, as a Viet Q living in Switzerland and that's not a very big 
majority of, of artists and she gets random messages from people going, oh, can you, what do you think about this project? And she's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just happen to be Vietnamese, but I'm, I'm not going to comment on it. So it's, I don't know <laughs> the answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, sorry, the question wasn't addressed to me, but I felt like <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, but it, it's just a topic that I, I I struggle with, I guess, on a daily basis. Not really a struggle, but I guess when I, I started out, uh, you know, um, when I started my photography journey uh, together, like my personal practice, and together with Matka, um, it felt really lonely. You know, because um, there wasn't any role model like a oh, working photo artist who's also a woman and who's also like doing, uh, taking on all these kinds of editorial, managerial duties. Uh, and then, you know, like uh, how, how do you balance that with your personal life? You know? um, and uh, at one point, uh, I even felt like, you know, I had to choose, you know, between one thing or another. I have to choose between pursuing, um, you know, career achievements and all that, uh, or, you know, just give up my identity as, you know, a photographer in order to, you know, focus on building, you know, this space, you know, which has got momentum and obviously uh, it's, it's not, you know, I'm not really patting myself on the back, but I think it's, it's an important thing that the scene needs. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to all that, um, but I think well, first of all, I think it's important to take into account your own growth, artistic and, um, and, and, and intellectual, and also your own mental health, um, you know, when doing community work, because it can be, there can be moments of fatigue and confusion. But at the same time, uh, I'm a firm believer in, you know, like the cliche of like, if you want to go far, you have to go with other people. Um, and uh, social responsibility is a big word, but I believe that it's like so firmly entrenched in, you know, my work in photography as someone who, um, you know, who likes to make photographs and also who would like to join hands with others in, in making that process happen. Yep. Thanks. That's a great. I love it how you jumped in as well. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, in saying that, Hanin, what do you, uh, in, when we're through the conversation so far, like we're talking about identity and also your role as you know an artist, but actually now you've got a role as a researcher as well. But your practice at the moment, it really has a very strong personal. Like it feels like it has a really strong personal connection. How do you connect through your work on a different level, like through research with a wider audience? Or have you so far with other Vietnamese people while talking about identity and how does, can you speak a bit about that? Like what, how people are responding to your work and what they're saying? I think that um, I don't know much about doing research, to be honest, because, um, you know, my best means to do my research is chat GPT-4 and a lot of introductory <laughs> books. I really I have a collection of maybe 200 introductory books on a lot of topics. Uh, um, so uh, I, um, before my, before, before my PhD, when I show my work, I feel like a lot of people uh, responded um, uh, like, okay, this guy crazy, uh, you know, this map look like crazy and, and you know, maybe I'm crazy. <laughs> But but I, I, I feel like um, the, the art that I create, uh, it comes from, um, you know, objective grounds, uh, you know, to, to, some, to, to a certain degree. And the PhD is uh, the next step for me to realize how I can put it in a more like objective, um, you know, ground to show people that the problem that I'm addressing is not like my imagined thing, but it's a real thing. And I truly believe it's a real thing because uh, when I put, um, you know, Vinfast and all other cases on the map, uh, I have a very strong reason why I put them in those positions. And for now, I, I don't, I don't know how to articulate the reasons yet. But that is the job of my research for the next three years. I'll try my best to, you know, um, be a, articulate everything. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but that's 
maybe my best answer. <laughs> Thanks. That's uh, really insightful also. Um, I, I like to uh, address a question to, to Eddie, actually. Um, and uh, I must say, in a way, I, I'm, I'm a little envious for the fact that you are so, so new to Vietnam because you, you get to experience all these things that I think for anyone who is here for a long time start to seem so normal in a way, right? So I, so I think sometimes it's really great to have this new um, like view or like fresh, fresh view on something. But I wonder at the same time, how does that relate to what we're discussing here, the future heritage? Is there a place in the future heritage for like the view on the surface, so to say? And is that important too? Or um, how, how do you see that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, uh, Christian. And it's something I didn't really answer mm -hmm. um, I, in the presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there is a place for the surface, absolutely, of course. You know, um, you know I mean, habits and practices change over time, you know, um, how people kind of, you know, I mean, <laughs> I was speaking with Alan about the packs of rubbish the other day, I keep going on about it, but you know, I mean, even it, that, that, that will change, you know, I mean, like, um, I'm just, I was just so intrigued by how polite they were, you know, they're almost like offerings in themselves, you know, how long will that practice last, you know, um, and in terms of the one I showed there, you know, I mean, it's shoes under domestic waste, under something else, you know, they're just intriguing packages. Um, um, the surface is something that's always changing. You can see it in the city. The first time I came to the city was eight years ago. And I mean, the change I, I see it in, in it in eight years is huge. You know, th th that's the thing. And, and that's both in, you know, uh, cityscapes, infrastructure. Um, the, the motorbikes have not decreased or increased with exactly the same. Um, you know, but I, I'm for a country that's um, incredibly proud of its heritage, some aspects of it won't change, but it will, it will mature, it will, it will become something else as these things often do, you know. So, absolutely, an archive of now is vitally important for, for the future, so people, A, can kind of go back and say, well, yes, that is how it was, and B, that's how it was, or maybe we don't want it to be that, that way anymore, you know, the, or the, that's a bit 50-50, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a really good point. Okay, do we have more questions in the audience? Yeah. Thank you to all of the speakers for your great presentations today. Um, I have two questions. The first one is to uh, Pham Haning. I, I, I was really interested in your presentation and like all of the vision that you're articulating in your amazing map. And I would love to know more about it. So I was wondering if there's like, if you have uploaded online anywhere, or if there's like any space where we can access it and like learn more about it. Because I know that you didn't have enough time to explain most of it today. Um, so that's the first question for you. The second question, I guess, is for all of the speakers here. Since I have seen like this shared um, theme across a lot of your work, uh, about archiving and kind of um, organizing, so collecting, organizing information um, about not only like past history, but also the present and, and then for the future as well. And um, I think that most of the time when we think about archive, uh, often, oftentimes we think about documentation, right? So like text or photographs or recordings. Um, so I was wondering if you have um, considered or if you are planning to work with like other forms of archives. So for example, like when we talk about history, um, of course, because like uh, I'm trained in anthropology, so we talk about oral histories quite a lot and they don't really have like a solid form of archiving. But like stories, like storytelling or archiving, like movement, like the bodies can be um, a type of archive or like how you work with textiles. So like for a lot of communities, textiles are a form of archiving, uh, but they're oftentimes they're not considered um, archives in the conventional sense. So I'm just wondering if you have any consideration, any thoughts or any plans to work with alternative forms of archive in the future. Thank you. Uh, uh, you, you see the QR, do you see the QR code? So that will lead to my website. And uh, my website is handing.com. I was lucky enough to have the website of my name. Uh, so uh, there is a part where you click on, you find Country X and all the maps. And Country X is uh, one project, and my land is another project. So uh, Country X is like the project where I 
uh, you know, articulate the social or political position of my land. You, you can approach it this way. Uh, I don't really have, um, you know, an intention to uh, write anything or to, you know, uh, record a presentation yet because I feel like uh, things are very complex and, you know, um, it's good to just throw everything out first. At this stage, I want to accumulate data. Uh, maybe in the next few years, I don't know, um, 10 years in the future, uh, I might be able to do it, but for now, I just cannot. And um, if you ask about archival stuff, I think I'm not doing archival in a, like orthodox sense of the term, but I'm interested in the culture in the non-cultural sectors. So for example, I showed at GreenFast and all the business culture, I'm interested in you know, that type of culture. I feel like we are artists, we don't usually look at those things. But I don't want to be identified as an artist for now. I just, you know, those things are really interesting to me and I want to go and document it in, on my maps. And yeah, I, I don't know if that could be considered um, archive, archiving or not, but um, I just want to accumulate enough data and, and see how uh, the data will lead me. Um, I, I can say something about archives. Um, I can say that I don't know a lot about archiving and the, the concept and the philosophy around archiving is incredibly problematic now and has been um, in discussion in the cultural sector for many years. Um, I am always quite hesitant in working with archives um, in the sense of creating them in, uh, in what voice do I have um, in the act of collecting and how is that going to contribute to a community? So I'm not super confident uh, in the archiving kind of world, if you like. Um, I do know a lot of sound archives that exist um, that are potentially artists that are doing it or also um, there's specific Asian um, sound archives that can be just field recordings. There's like many field recording nerds that come through, um, but similar problematic in uh, there are many traveling sound people that will come through Vietnam and that will want to um, find that particular ethnic minority instrument that is, they imagine is being played on a hilltop. Um, and so I believe like also the question is should we archive and do we need to archive everything? Um, I was part of, uh, one of the beginnings of the reading group was I was part of a reading group and it was online and the question of should we archive the conversations for further reference was like, well, no, because not everything does. And it's also, in order to archive, you are producing waste and you are making more material. Um, it's not just about ordering, you are also like putting out a new structure into the world so it doesn't need yeah. And also accessibility is always the biggest issue, like once you archive, it's a huge amount of work in, it in order to keep the archive alive and to order to keep it relevant. And so it's not, again, not just about like gathering and ordering, there's also like how invested are you um, to keep that ongoing as an initiative. Um, Um, but I think I, through my creative project at the moment, have created an accidental archive, and that is um, an archive of all the names of the people that I've met throughout the day. So I have this very bad habit of forgetting people's names. Um, and so um, in my research at the moment, I'm very interested in names, um, particularly the anglicisation of names and um, how that's maybe a symptom of internalised racism or assimilation, particularly within Australia. Um, anyway, so I have a piece of fabric at home and I'm trying at the end of each night to stitch the names of the people that I've met throughout the day. Um, and it was just kind of my way of 
processing the name, remembering the name, remembering my interaction with them. Um, and it's, yeah, it's growing. Um, I don't know what I'll do with it, <laughs> um, but I think that's another form of archive, is kind of this very tactile uh, and therapeutic process. Um, uh, I just want to add something that uh, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, pop and mainstream culture. And uh, I do think social media is uh, also part of the archive. Um, and I think um, I actually practice this every day, you know, using Instagram or Facebook. Um, and I do think that uh, archive of the future, if we use social media in uh, in the way, like I always use social media in as an archival uh, kind of activities or practice, and uh, I think the um, the archival works is more now into like um, kind of the interaction between people. Uh, it's like kind of network of uh, you know uh, people like personal stories than just like. Uh, um, a collection of data from some someone, but uh, it's more like uh, the the interaction, social interaction on the virtual world. So uh, yeah, that's uh, my thoughts about the future of the archives. So yeah, tag me on uh, Instagram. Two minds. <laughs> um, just interested in your thoughts since we're at a kind of RMIT event. Um, some of us are here with the support of the Australian government, the Australian embassy was here, Australian ambassador was here. I'm like so impressed by all this amazing work that's going on and all the space that's being created by all your incredible initiatives. I'm kind of interested as someone who works for RMIT. Um, you know, if you have any comments on like the role of an institution like RMIT in supporting, you know, it's, can it do more? Can, you know, like Australian government, for instance, you know, or, you know, not to, to do the, the inverse as well, right? Like are there problems, are there, you know, complexities, are there, you know, or, you know, or is it indifferent? I don't know, I'm just curious in like, yeah, how, how how you can get the support that you need to keep doing the work because you know conscious of the labor and all those things that have come up so just interested in any reflections on that I think that's a fantastic question actually um, especially for like a foreign university in Vietnam um, Alan you're gonna get me fired <laughs> Um, who's listening in the room? Um, I don't think that RMIT or you know these institutions need to do more. I think they should do uh, what they're doing, but better. Um, I something that Tao Vu said um, in the first session that really resonated with me was creating safe spaces, um, and I definitely feel like. Um, you know, these big organisations and institutions are run by KPIs and oftentimes um, people get overlooked. Um, I think that we all could be better at building these safe spaces for these amazing practitioners just to do what they do best. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I think that's, that's a good starting point, but um, any other comments from... We're also happy with money. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know what RMIT does <laughs> very deeply, uh, oh. um, apart from what I've seen today and, and knowing the institution from Australia. Um, I mean, we're sitting in an institution of Vietnam, so it's a little bit difficult to kind of like <laughs> bear our souls as to what we think should happen in the country. Um, I guess we, 
many of us here share just yeah this basic struggle of how to administratively, legally, if you want to, <laughs> uh, run an organization, um, which is, I mean, possibly one of the things that I would wish for the future of Vietnam is that the bureaucracy and administrative process is somehow, somehow lightened so that it's actually doable because there is, you know, many people that want to do it properly, but it's very, very difficult and time consuming and expensive and all these kinds of things. So I think um, there is a, a strong will for the creative sector to um, engage more in the public discussion and to be part of policy development and to um, have some kind of recognition that creative industry and creatives can participate socially, legally, um, responsibly into the development of the country, which is what I think we all kind of believe in, but at this point in time does n is not facilitated by the policies in place. So I don't think you can do much about that. <laughs> but then also, yeah, I would like to just take it from, from uh, Elise about, uh, you know, like re respond to the public discussions, you know, but then, but then, uh, by doing that, just be a good example, you know, like a very, very good one, and that's already like like uh, something that's very, very meaningful to the students. And then I, I actually, it's like a lot of us here. I mean, I'm talking about the, the the local projects here. We're doing what we've been doing just because we have no examples, you know, mm -hmm. or like there were examples that were, they were not that you know like good of an example. That's why we have to be one, you know. We like I don't want to be one, you know, but then. But then, but then it's just I'm, I have to do the thing I, I got to do. You know. Hey, thank you so much. I think um, it's a good time. Oh, there's another question. Sorry, I didn't see where. Ah, yeah, oh, two questions. <laughs> uh, thank you for the, all the wonderful sharings from you. And uh, maybe I just have one question that is somehow related and not really related to the symposium today is that I think the concept of like Vietnamese identity somehow arise in the story of uh, Matka in the way you want to grow to break the stereotype of how people see Vietnam and also in uh, the story of uh, Haling when you talk about like you have someone questions like how you like are you denying your like Vietnamese origin? So I think I want to ask like the other people if uh, you have any like thoughts on uh, the Vietnamese identity. What is that? And also like how do you cooperate if you do cooperate it in your practices? And also like does it somehow help with shaping the future heritage in Vietnam? Was the question for? Uh, no, actually, it's for everyone who, if anyone has the like, somehow wonders about it, like, yeah, please, please share your thoughts. Especially, I want to hear from those who have been raised in another country and like only been living here or like have been living in Vietnam for a long time. Yeah, so see like the insights from more like the outsider. I feel like it's a pretty vulnerable thing to be discussing. Um, but I, so I was born and raised in Melbourne. Um, I've owned, my family, uh, uh, my mum and dad is from Mi Tho down south. Um, and I've only been to Vietnam a handful of time to visit family as a younger person. Um, so the answer to what is Vietnam or what is Vietnamese is, um, I don't know and I'm still learning because I think that growing up in Australia, um, and going through the process of assimilation, um, there is a disconnection to your cultural heritage. And I feel like now as an artist and as a researcher, I'm on this journey of kind of reconnecting or learning more about it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I feel like I need to ignore it, but strategically, 
uh, but uh, the, the idea is not to destroy the Vietnamese identity. The idea is to ignore it in a mindful way so that we can build it stronger. And I don't think much about Vietnamese-ness, but I believe that if I can be independent, it's the best citizen I, I will become. And that is that can fulfill my spirit of being a nationalist without referring to Vietnam. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure what to say. So I grew up also in Melbourne, uh, outskirts of Melbourne. My father is from Hanoi and my mother is from the north of France, but I lived my first um, 18 years in Australia and then uh, in Europe and now here for seven years. Um, and so um, it's a very niche market, my peoples, in, in the trio cultural sense. There's not many people that are very familiar with those three cultures simultaneously. Um, so I do not, um, I feel quite fluid in between them. And so I can't quite pinpoint what my Vietnamese-ness is um, concretely. Um, and I think like, maybe that responds to the question. Um, I think it's also, it's such a personal journey uh, and it has also to do with like your lived experience of the, the conversations and the encounters that you've had and also like my relations to my family. So I, m myself and my brother, who is the only try um, of those cultures that I know, have completely different views as to what we are as um, culturally. Um, and I, for um, Hanoian, born and raised Hanoians, I'll never be Vietnamese enough to claim a Vietnamese identity generally is the feeling. Um, Australia has a, a particular view on the immigrant story and especially Vietnamese immigrants and it's quite celebratory of the success stories but um, potentially ignores the um, trials and tribulations of what that is. France is a whole other world of, of just general confusion as to what my um, life could be like, but yeah, I, I don't know how to... I, th I think I'm familiar with what the Vietnamese-ness can be represented elsewhere and how other people see it, um, but for my own personal feelings, I'm a little bit... I'm also as confused as many other people in that. Mm. I just want to say a little bit uh, from, from my own experience coming from the field of, of uh, uh, you know, photojournalism, because we we are storyteller, we are we are hired to do the job you now to tell the story to the world out there. So um, I'm I'm not talking about that Vietnamese, you, you know, because I'm just not even sure what it is. But then I I, I do believe that the indicator of you know like of, of being like born and raised here, you know, I'm telling like my story or like my people's stories is so important because there's a thing in the world of journalism that there are a lot of people they're gonna list like, okay, I'm gonna base between Hanoi and Paris, you know, that, that mobility, like we don't count it here, you know, and, and, and also I think it's also a big kind of like important indicator of like, like who you are, you know, who, who you, you, you should trust, you know, telling this story. No, otherwise, like okay, like you coming in from Paris, that good, you know. But then, but then, okay, we may just like give that room to like someone else around here, you know. Like, I mean, we we call it a lot of impacts socially, politically, and then economically, you know. And 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 and, and, and so like, I I think that that that's still like a big portion that we should count on, you know, it's in 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 order to deliver the message because we are we're someone producing that that content, you know, and put it out and well, I'm just talking specifically in the term of like journalists and, and, and photographers and so on. I think it might have been you, you shared a um, very interesting article on how a lot of tourism photos and things are staged. Um, do, are you aware of that article or am I... I am aware, but I did, did not see that. You know. Yeah, okay, okay, so I'm not sure where I saw it. But that's an interesting phenomenon. So things that people elsewhere and here that might be perceiving as being Vietnamese-ness are actually being staged, you know, and that's why we're seeing a lot of very similar photography coming out, say, in, you know, in terms of the tourism photos. Mm. 
Well, actually, uh, I'm very okay with that phenomenon, you know, because it boosts tourism, you know, it's good for my people. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I think that's the same story with AI. Like, you, you're generating content, right? But then that's so crucial right now to have professional, well-trained, you know, uh, journalists and photographer to be out there. And then, and, and then you know the people you look for, you know, to follow them and then to follow their story. And then and I just consider all those, uh, like, like, like photo tour and so on, you know, the, the things they produce, just, okay, just like another noise out there, you know, and then we don't, like, like me, myself, I just, I think it's just a good phenomenon, you know, it's the, like, it, it's the part of the pop culture, you know, and I just love seeing that, actually, you know, to, to see that people do care, you know, about, like, my country, you know, so maybe. Um, I th I'm not exactly against the phenomenon, you know, like I don't think we should all go and denounce it as like, oh, you're telling lies and, you know, it is not authentic Vietnam and, and photo ops shouldn't be staged, you know, it's, it's a whole other discussion, I guess. Uh, but I think what is more interesting, uh, a more interesting conversation that could come out of that phenomenon is how we, you know, because I felt like, you know, the also the culture of tourism is also something quite performative mm -hmm. and there are specific things to look for uh, and to photograph whether it's staged or not. Um, and then, yeah, but I, I mean, I think there's a whole economy behind it and you know, as long as my people are somehow benefiting from all the tours, then I'm good, you know. It's not really a black and white thing so, and so photography like is a cult, you know, yeah. people care about certain things that maybe like People outside of the photography circle don't really, are not really interested in. So, yeah. yeah but, but then I think yeah, that story is, is more about responsible tourism, you know, rather than photography. I don't think there's much to do with photography over there. You know, yeah. they do what they, they they want to do. You know. Okay. Any last question? So. Tôi cũng, lần uh, đầu tiên tôi bày tỏ lòng biết ơn, thực sự dưới uh, tôi khóc rất là nhiều. Bởi vì tôi cũng là người làm dự án, hiện tại là tôi làm 19 cái dự án trong cái đề án khơi nguồn văn hóa Việt. Uh, nhưng mà thực sự thì tôi cũng xin chúc phúc tất cả các dự án đều thành công. Cái đấy là đầu tiên. Nhưng mà có một dự án tôi rất là quan tâm đó là của em, em Ninh, là Phạm Hà Linh. Ấy. Bởi vì đây là đi theo dòng họ. Cao Phạm nó có cái đặc trưng khác là cái chữ pho là cái thủ lĩnh, đấy, có lịch sử là Thủ tướng Phạm Văn Đồng, đấy, Phạm Nhật Vượng và hiện tại là Phạm Minh Chính. Đấy là cái nguồn gốc họ Phạm thì mình em ạ. Nghĩa là cái máu thủ lĩnh nó trong đầu, không bao giờ muốn là cái gì cho ai. Cho nên khi em nói là em đọc tuyên ngôn độc lập ấy, thì chị có cũng đang công việc đằng kia nhưng mà chị đã nói là đây là cái nút thắt rất quan trọng. Cũng như chị thôi mọi người, chị nói là 19 dự án mà đã xác định làm là sau này có những con đường mang tên mình. Đúng ạ, xác định làm như thế. Còn tôi không ấn định là bao nhiêu tiền, nhưng tôi đã xác định làm là sau này có những con đường mang tên tôi. Đã xác định như thế. Đấy, cái, cái máu lãnh đạo như thế. Em hình dung không? Cho nên chị cũng chưa hiểu hết cái, cái ý tưởng của em. Nhưng chị mong là ở sau cái buổi hôm nay ấy, thì cũng kết nối được với em với uh, họ Phạm. Tại vì rất là may mắn là bố chị cũng là một trong ba tổ chức của Uleco. Uh, các dòng họ Việt Nam có thể là nếu không có sự trợ, hỗ trợ của các dòng họ phạm như thế em mất 10 năm nhưng có thể có sự hỗ trợ thì em sẽ mất ngắn hơn đúng không ạ cho nên là chị uh, đã nói mọi người không làm thì thôi nhưng đã làm là có những con đường mang tên mình Đấy, xin cảm ơn em rất nhiều cảm ơn cả nhà Okay, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say a very, very big thank you to all of you for uh, your presentations and your generosity with answering all the questions. So it's been a fabulous session and we really, really admire you and you've inspired us all. So thank you so much. Thanks.